Time. The chair will now recognize the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would ask the press to maybe clear out of the middle here so we can see our witnesses and proceed with the hearing. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on victims of violent crime in Manhattan. We are joined today by some of our colleagues who would like to participate in the hearing. Uh, Ms. Stefanik, Mr. Goldman, whose district we're in, and Mr. Espayat. Per an agreement with Mr. Nadler and without objection, these members will be permitted to participate in today's hearing for only the purpose of asking questions of the witnesses. Each side will have an additional five minutes for these members to question uh, the witnesses. The chair now recognizes himself for an opening Mr. statement. Mr. Chairman, I, I have a unanimous consent request. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent. I, I understand Mr. Alba may be utilizing the services of an interpreter today and so, so that the interpretation time would occur off the clock so that we might be able to ask questions of Mr. Alba. Without objection, uh, so ordered. While we're speaking of time, uh, I know we, we have to be back in, in the Capitol tonight for some votes, so we'll, the chair will probably be pretty darn strict with the uh, – with a five-minute rule, but we want to make sure our, all our witnesses get their full five minutes and members get their, uh, their time to question. Today's hearing is about the administration of justice and keeping communities safe, something that has always been a central focus of the House Judiciary Committee. Our witnesses today have felt the effects of crime up close and personal. They've been victimized by a justice system that cares more about political correctness than punishing the criminals who've harmed them and harmed their family. We thank them for being here and sharing their story. Their stories are emblematic of a city that's lost its way when it comes to fighting a crime and upholding the law. As we all know, fairness under the law is a bedrock principle of American democracy. In this country, justice is supposed to be blind, regardless of race, religion, or creed. However, here in Manhattan, the scales of justice are weighed down by politics. For the district attorney, justice isn't blind. It's about looking for opportunities to advance a political agenda, a radical political agenda. Rather than enforcing the law, the DA is using his office to do the bidding of left-wing campaign funders. He's taken a soft on crime approach to the real criminals. One of Mr. Bragg's first actions upon taking office in January of 2022 was to put out a memo that directed his assistant district attorneys not to prosecute certain crimes, including trespassing and resisting arrest. The memo also stated that armed robberies should not be prosecuted as felonies. Instead, they were to be considered as misdemeanor larceny unless someone was shot during the course of the robbery. Thank goodness, after a backlash from police groups and the public, Mr. Bragg agreed to prosecute some robberies as felonies, but left the rest of the memo in place. The president of NYPD Detectives Endowment Association said, quote, Bragg gives criminals the roadmap to freedom from prosecution and control of our streets. In Bragg's Manhattan, you can resist arrest, deal drugs, obstruct arrest, and even carry a gun to get away with it. And guess what happened under this new policy? More crime. In 2022, Mr. Bragg's first year as district attorney, New York City saw a 23% surge in major crimes. Felony assaults rose 13 percent, robberies spiked 26 percent, burglaries in New York City went up 23 percent, grand larcenies were up 26 percent, and auto theft increased 32 percent, transit crime surged nearly 30 percent. Imagine that. You leave criminals on the street, you get more crime. Patrick Lynch, the president of the Police Benevolent Association, said, police officers don't want to be sent out to enforce laws that the district attorneys won't prosecute. There are already too many people who believe that they can commit crimes, resist arrest, interfere with police officers, <clears throat> and face zero consequences. We should take a minute here to thank our brave men and women in law enforcement. We've got a number of them right here in this building. Thank you for what you do. In the last few years, police have been villainized and harassed by the left and even defunded. These men and women put their lives on the line every day 
every single day, and they deserve our deepest gratitude. But that's not what they're getting from left-wing district attorneys here and around the country. Police do their job. They do the hard work. They go out on the streets. They catch the bad guys, and then the DAs don't do theirs, don't do their job. Instead, they let bad guys roam the street. As we'll hear today, repeat offenders are plaguing New York City. On April 6, 2023, NYPD Commissioner Seawall said, recidivism is the undertow pulling against everything we're doing to keep our city safe. It is counterproductive to public safety and frankly is a perpetual carousel of police resources. Astonishingly, Sewell said that 327 individuals were arrested more than 6,000 times for retail theft. Think about that. 327 individuals responsible for 6,000 retail thefts, what we used to call stealing, taking someone else's property, each person arrested on average 20 times. Maybe we wouldn't have had that problem if they had arrested them and kept them in jail after the first, the second, or maybe even the 19th time, average of 20 times. Given the record of crime, the record level of crime we are seeing around the country, our plan this Congress has been to include field hearings in some of our greatest cities, to analyze and highlight how soft on crime policies hurt families, hurt communities, hurt small business owners. We believe it's important to hear from victims and their families who simply want to share their stories, hoping, hoping that it will help create change so other families don't have to suffer like they did. What better place to start than New York City, where videos of violent senseless attacks appear almost daily and where the DA of Lower Manhattan earned a reputation for caring more about the perpetrators of crime than the victims. Thanks again to all our brave witnesses for being here. And thanks to the NYPD, the Capitol Police, and the Federal Protective Services for all they do to keep people safe. And now, now recognize, uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me be very clear. We are here today in Lower Manhattan for one reason and one reason only. The chairman is doing the bidding of Donald Trump. Committee Republicans designed this hearing to intimidate and deter the duly elected district attorney of Manhattan from doing the work his constituents elected him to do. They have demanded access to the inner workings of an ongoing criminal case, information to which they know they are not entitled. They have subpoenaed a witness who used to work for the district attorney, whom they know cannot answer their questions. And they have earned a lawsuit that risks future congressional oversight as a result. They have perpetuated the anti-Semitic and racist tropes that Mr. Trump has directed at both the prosecutor and the judge in this case. They are using their public offices and the resources of this committee to protect their political patron, Donald Trump. It is an outrageous abuse of power. It is to use the chairman's favorite term, a weaponization of the House Judiciary Committee. I do not know if Mr. Trump will be found guilty. I do not suspend, know. Gentlemen, suspend. The gallery uh, should refrain from commenting and let the gentleman from New York finish his statement. Gentleman is recognized. I do not know if Mr. Trump will be, will be found guilty by a jury of his peers here in New York, or for that matter in Georgia or in Washington, D.C., on charges that may follow, but I do know that he will have his day in court. Using this committee to undermine that process as it unfolds is cynical, unethical, and given the violence unleashed in, on the Capitol by the former president, just plain dangerous. Now, we all grieve for the victims of violent crime here in Manhattan and everywhere, but it is shameful that the Republicans of this committee would use the pretext of violent crime as an excuse to play tourist in New York and bully the district attorney. It is particularly disgraceful that they would use this pretext after doing nothing, nothing, to stop the gun violence that terrorizes our nation. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been at least 146 mass shootings this year alone. That means there have been more mass shootings than days so far this year. Three people were shot dead and five others injured at Michigan State University. Three children and three teachers were shot and killed at a private school in Nashville, Tennessee. Five people are dead and eight others, including two police officers, are injured after a mass shooting at a bank in Louisville, Kentucky. 
These tragedies have taken place in nearly every corner of our nation, although I note in the study by every town that in states where elected officials have taken action to pass gun safety laws, dramatically fewer people die by gun violence. And although there has not, thank God, been a recent mass shooting here in Manhattan, we must do more to stem the iron pipeline. The illicit flow of illegal firearms from states that do less to protect their citizens to New York and elsewhere. Unlike our Republican colleagues, Democrats have consistently advanced policies that make all of our communities, including New York, safer places to live, to work, to worship, and to go to school. Last Congress, over the objection of every Republican here today, we passed the first gun violence prevention package in decades. We can and must do more. We must pass universal background checks. We must implement red flag laws to keep guns away from those who are a danger to themselves and others. And we must reinstate the assault weapons ban. Each of these proposals are overwhelmingly popular with the American public, and each is opposed by House Republicans. We also advanced the Victim Act to provide funding to law enforcement to improve murder clearance rates. If my Republican colleagues were serious about violent crime and sincere in their efforts for law enforcement, they would have joined us in that effort. But 178 Republicans opposed that measure last Congress on the House floor. We supported legislation to improve policing through additional funding, better training, and accountability to strengthen public trust because we know that public safety requires law enforcement agencies and their community partners working together. Again, every Republican on the committee stood opposed. Here in New York, one of the largest and most complex cities in the world, local leaders have pursued violence intervention, diversion programs, targeted law enforcement, and youth engagement programs that have pushed crime and incarceration to the lowest levels in decades. Over the past year, under the leadership of Mayor Adams and District Attorney Bragg, crime in Manhattan has dropped in nearly every major category, including murders down 14 percent, shootings down 17 percent, burglaries down 21 percent, and robberies down 8 percent, all in one year. And compare that to Mr. Jordan's Ohio, where the homicide rate is 73 percent higher than in Manhattan. And on the specific topic of gun violence, the district attorney is to be commended for securing indictments against gun traffickers, ghost gun manufacturers, and other violent criminals, leading to a full 20 percent reduction in shootings last year. The chairman says this hearing is about violent crime in Manhattan, but New York remains one of the safest big cities in America. I'm sure my colleagues have talking points and anecdotes to the contrary, but the evidence is firmly on our side. And the evidence shows, unfortunately, that the chairman could have held this hearing back in Washington or in Ohio or in any other jurisdiction where the numbers are trending in the wrong direction. But instead, he rushed to hold a hearing here in Manhattan in defense of Donald Trump. I understand that in the days leading up to this hearing, Republican members were instructed not to speak about Mr. Trump during these proceedings. Don't take the bait, they were warned, as if we cannot draw a straight line from the chairman's attacks on the district attorney in the wake of the indictment to his attacks on the district attorney here today. We know better. We all know better. The New Yorkers gathered outside of this building certainly know better. You can pretend that you aren't here on Donald Trump's behalf, but you cannot stop the New York criminal justice system from running its course, and you will not intimidate New Yorkers with your brief visit to this city. I thank the chairman, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman for his statement. And now, um, uh, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witnesses, Mr. Jose Alba. Mr. Alba was forced to defend himself by working at a bodega. He was attacked by a repeat criminal who was on parole for assaulting a police officer. During the attack, Mr. Alba was stabbed and defended himself with a knife. Despite surveillance videos showing that he acted in self-defense, Alba was arrested and charged with murder. These charges were later dropped after public outrage, including from Mayor Adams and former NYPD Commissioner Bill Bratton. Thank you, Mr. Alba, for being here. Ms. Jennifer Harrison. Ms. Harrison is the founder of Victims' Rights New York, an organization that advocates on behalf of victims and survivors of homicide victims. Ms. Harrison's boyfriend was killed in 2005. We've heard you talk about this, Ms. Harrison. We, we appreciate you being here. Two of, the assistants, or excuse me, two of the assailants were allowed to walk free, while the third spent only a few years 
in jail. Mr. Jim Kessler. Mr. Kessler is the executive vice president uh, for policy and co-founder of the Third Way. He previously served as legislative and policy director to Senator Schumer. Ms. Madeline Brame. Ms. Brame is the New York State Chairwoman of the Victims' Rights Reform Council. The Victims' Rights Reform Council was formed to provide a voice and advocate for victims of crime. Ms. Brame's son, Sergeant Hanson Correa, was murdered in 2018 by four assailants. Sergeant Correa's father was also stabbed during the attack. Ms. Brame, we're sorry for your loss. Thank you as well for being here. The Honorable Robert F. Holden, Councilman Holden, represents District 30 on the New York City Council. He co-leads the Common Sense Caucus with Councilman Joe Borelli. He previously was a member of the Community Board Five Queens for 30 years, served as first chair for seven years, and served as chairman of the board's Public Safety Committee for 13 years. Mr. Holden, thank you for being here and for your public service. Ms. Rebecca Fisher. Ms. Fisher is the Executive Director of New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. Her organization seeks to inform the public, particularly youth, about the dangers of gun violence and ways to prevent and reduce gun violence. Mr. Paul DiGiacomo is the president of New York Police Detectives Endowment Association. The association represents 20,000 active and retired New York City detectives. Mr. DiGiacomo served with the NYPD for 40 years. Thank you. And Mr. Barry Borgen. Mr. Borgen's son was a victim of a violent crime who was targeted because of his faith his Jewish faith. While walking near a pro-Israel rally, Mr. Borgen's son was attacked and beaten by at least four men. They said all kinds of terrible things, sprayed mace in his face. Mr. Borgen, we're sorry for that and what happened to your son. Thank you for being here today. We welcome our witnesses. Thank them for appearing today. You each be given five minutes. The clock there, when it gets to the yellow, that means it's kind of close. And like I said before, we'll try to be pretty strict on the time. But again, thank you all for, um, thank you all for being here. Mr. Alba, you're up first. Got to, we got to swear in. I forgot about that. We got to do that. Um, would you all please stand and raise your right hand? Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you, God. Let the record reflect the witnesses have all answered in the uh, affirmative. Uh, thank you. Please be seated. Please know that your written testimony will enter into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize, as I said before, your testimony in five minutes. Mr. Alba, you may begin. Thank you. You pull that, can you pull that mic real close there, sir? Pull that, there we go. It. It's on, I think, just pull it down right, right in front. Okay. Is there a green light? Uh, now it is, yeah. Good, good. So again, Imran H. Ansari on behalf of uh, my client, Mr. Alba, I deliver uh, his opening statement. First, I wanna make this clear. My testimony is not motivated by a political agenda. I am not here to support or side with any particular political party. I am not here because I'm supporting Republicans. I am not here because I want to criticize the Democrats. I just want to tell the public about the horrible experience I had to go through because of crime in this city. An experience that has changed my life and that I will never forget. On July 1st, 2022, I went to work at the bodega, just like any other day. I took pride in the hard work I put in every day at the store to earn my own money and support myself and my family. That is when I encountered a true and real threat to my life. After I simply told a woman that she could not have potato chips because her payment was declined, I was face to face with her boyfriend who seemed ready to kill me. He attacked me violently, threw me around the store. The woman stabbed me herself. I truly believed they were there to kill me. So faced with this, I did what I knew I had to do to save my life. What the law, what the law allows me to do to save my life. I stabbed that man in self-defense. 
But when the police came, even though I was injured myself, I was placed under arrest. I was taken to jail. When I came before the judge, the prosecutor said I was being charged with murder in the second degree. They asked for bail, even though so many people are being let go these days. And I couldn't afford it. So I went to Rikers Island. I was forced into a crowded and unsafe intake cell. Even though I was injured, in jail, I didn't get the medical treatment I should have received. I spent almost a week in Rikers Island before bail was lowered and I could be released. I was forced to endure the harsh conditions on Rikers Island as an innocent man. I still don't know why I was charged with murder. I believe that law enforcement and the DA's office didn't investigate the case fully. They rushed to judgment and I suffered because of it. Even though the charges were ultimately dropped, they should not have been brought against me to begin with. I am now traumatized from the incident. I am not working because I am terrified for my life that someone in a gang will come after me for revenge. I was injured physically and mentally because of the incident and my unlawful arrest and incarceration. My story is one that should not happen again. Crime does not discriminate on the basis of a political party. It needs to be addressed by law enforcement on the street and by prosecutors in the court. But it has to be aimed at the people committing crime, not an innocent man like me. And the next time an innocent man does nothing but protect their own life and self-defense from a violent attack, they should not be made the villain, but instead treated with care and compassion as the victim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Albaugh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Harrison, you're recognized for your five minutes. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jennifer Harrison. I'm the founder of Victims' Rights New York. Sadly, I was thrown into this world and forced to become an expert on the issues we are here to discuss when on January 15th of 2005, both my boyfriend and his best friend were murdered. Three brothers were arrested and charged, but justice was not served as two of these brothers, both who had records, were freed in a sweetheart deal. Ultimately, only one person served just nine and a half years for killing two people. Through that horrible experience, I connected with support groups on both the national and local level. I became an advocate against some of the atrocities I witnessed and tried to help other survivors of homicide victims connect with the resources they need to navigate through this endless nightmare. I have been doing so for over 18 years. I became more politically involved and got louder in 2017 when I learned of bail reform and other dangerous and deadly so-called social justice reforms. Nobody wanted to listen to us, though the victims that have to live with the consequences of these decisions for the rest of our lives when we warned of the harm that this would cause. Victims have no, po no voice in politics or government, so I want to thank this committee from the very bottom of my heart for giving victims that voice today. There is a depraved indifference towards human life sweeping across our country, even amongst elected officials. Normally, the criminals exude this depravity, yet here we have the one that is supposed to prosecute them as the one showing it. I would also like to say that if Alvin Bragg was doing his job, none of us would be here today to talk. We are not politicizing our issues or our loss. From day one, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg announced he would not prosecute even very violent crimes in his now infamous memo. We saw an immediate result. Two police officers were shot and killed, a 19-year-old girl was murdered while working at Burger King, and multiple police officers were shot in separate incidents. Things have not gotten better, only progressively worse. Bragg's office has downgraded 52% of felonies, and even when his office does decide to prosecute a case, they only have about a 50% conviction rate. No one is safer, as he promised, as a result of his delusion or diversions. During Bragg's first year in office in 2002, the crime index went up 25.57% borough-wide, violent crime up 11.73%, and in Manhattan South, one precinct alone, murders were up 40%. You will hear many horrible stories today. We read about them almost daily, like Madeline Brame and Jose Alba, whose testimonies will speak for themselves. I am here today on behalf of the many other victims that reach out to me and are afraid to speak out, who are completely distraught with the way they have been or are being treated by the career public defenders in Bragg's office. 
They are being told the office does not have the resources to prosecute their case. We have heard nothing about murdered victims Crystal Baranievs, Michelle Goh, Christina Lee, or how their cases are being handled. Christina Lee was brutally murdered by a mentally ill homeless man who was supposed to be under supervised release in a shelter run by a nonprofit. Who was supervising this emotionally disturbed man? How did this happen? The Manhattan DA's office has the authority and the duty to investigate and indict or make recommendations in situations like this that will keep New Yorkers safe and prevent it from happening again. Yet none of that has been done. Does Bragg's office not have the resources for this either? I have heard from victims of domestic violence and hate crimes that have not been charged who are also unable to get the support services they are not only entitled to, but that the Manhattan DA's office receives federal and state funding to provide. Why are they not providing these services efficiently? Over 65 assistant district attorneys left the office in the first half of 2022. Most were experienced veteran prosecutors that cannot be replaced. Only a select few are left in that office to fight for victims. What resources is Alvin Bragg using to replace those that left instead of using their exit as a scapegoat for not prosecuting cases? It is a very scary time to be here. God forbid you or your family are victimized. Who do you have to fight for you? No one. Alvin Bragg has given excuse after excuse to not prosecute violent crimes, forsaking not only the distraught and forever change victims, but the entire justice system. And we have no recourse when our rights are violated. We cannot file for prosecutorial misconduct. Only the criminals can, even when they violate our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Alvin Bragg's dereliction of duty and malfeasance has caused tremendous harm. In our newfound progressive society, all of the compassion and empathy is placed with those intentionally inflicting harm on others and not with the innocent casualty, the victim. So again, I thank you for giving victims a voice today and for allowing us to shed some light on what is happening here in hopes that it will change everywhere. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Ms. Bram, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Madeline Bram. I am the chairwoman of Victims Rights Reform Council. I'm also the mother of a homicide victim. My son, Sergeant Hassan Korea, Afghanistan War retired veteran, was killed in Harlem in 2018. Hassan was kicked, punched, stomped, and stabbed nine times by four individuals he did not know, nor had he done them any harm. All four of these individuals were apprehended and all four charged with first degree gang assault and second degree murder. This case just resolved this year. So this case drug on through the Manhattan criminal court system for four and a half years. When Alvin Bragg came into office, he was held, he was handed a strong trial ready murder case and gang assault case against all four of these individuals where this brutal, savage homicide was captured on video. He was handed a strong trial ready case, ready to go to trial. As soon as he took office, the case immediately began to unravel. He dismissed, completely dismissed, gang assault and murder indictments against two of the defendants clearly on video participating in the brutal savage slaughter of my son. Mary Saunders, the sister involved in the homicide. He dismissed her indictment and recharged her with assault with a shoe and sentenced her to one year time served. Travis Stewart dismissed his gang assault and murder indictment and sentenced him to attempted gang assault. And he pled guilty and sentenced him to seven years. Travis will be out in the next 18 months. Mary Saunders, the savage, is currently walking the streets of Harlem like she didn't just participate in the, in the brutal slaughter of another human being home with her family, home with her children. If that's, not a threat, uh, if that's not a threat to public safety, I don't know what is. She's capable at any moment of snapping and attacking someone and holding them while someone else 
plunges a butcher knife into their body nine times and another person 12 times and then run away and leave their body in the street to bleed to death. This is the type of criminal element that we have walking the streets of New York City on a daily basis. All types of criminal elements. Free to do what they want, when they want, however they want, to whomever they want, with no consequences, no deterrence. We have these anti-gang violence, these credible messenger, millions and billions of our hard-earned tax dollars are going to fund these organizations that are doing absolutely nothing to deter this crime. They're doing absolutely nothing. And I propose another, not another dime of our federal tax dollars be pumped into these organizations until they can produce some measurable outcomes of effectiveness of what they're doing with our tax dollars to protect the public. Audience, there is no audience participation. Ms. Bram, you keep going. And as far as the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, if he's receiving one penny of federal dollars, you need to pull that funding until he starts doing his damn job and prosecuting crime. I was totally disrespected. Me, my family, my grandchildren, we were treated like garbage. Like garbage. I've sat for four and a half years and saw mothers walk in and out. We have a mother sitting here right now whose son, two sons, one died and the other one is on a coloscopy bag. This is out of Darcel Clark's jurisdiction. So I'm not the only one. There are hundreds and thousands of us. We don't give a damn about your politics. We don't care. It could be the man from the moon who's running for president, okay? As long as whoever's in there, it stands for law and order and is going to return some civility and sanity to our city. Thank you. Thank you. I've said it a couple times. The audience should, should refrain from, uh, from applause. Or, uh, Mr. Ms. Brame, oh, though, thank you for that powerful testimony. Okay. Mr. Holden, you are now recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Chair Jordan, and, and thank you, Madeline, for Pull your courage. Pull that close. Pull that close, Councilman. Pull that real close. I am Robert Holden, a Democratic City Council member representing the 30th District in the Borough of Queens and a member of the Council's Public Safety Committee. I am here to address the lawlessness that has taken over this city in recent years as a result of the failed progressive policies implemented by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. On his first day in office, Bragg issued a memo that would decriminalize a broad range of offenses and reduce charges for violent crimes. This was a signal for every criminal that it was open season on law-abiding citizens in New York County. These failed progressive policies reverse 30 years of law and order delivered to the city by the hardworking men and women of the NYPD and professional prosecutors that put victims' rights ahead of criminals. Under Bragg, minor crimes such as resisting arrest, trespassing, fare evasion, prostitution are no longer prosecuted, which has led to a marked increase in criminal activity on the streets of Manhattan. Serious offenses such as knife point robbery, commercial and residential burglaries, weapons possession, and low-level drug dealing are being charged with lesser offenses or being plea bargained down, resulting in shorter sentences or no jail time at all. Bragg's first year in office was marked by a dramatic shift in the way his office approached criminal prosecutions. And we are feeling Bragg's soft on crime approach in the streets of New York. We have repeat offenders receiving lenient sentences and committing multiple crimes shortly after being released. This is happening every day. Mm -hmm. From the day he took office, it seems Alvin Bragg's top priority was to keep criminals out of jail and free to roam the streets. District Attorney Bragg would be better off as a defense attorney than a prosecutor. He downgraded over half of the felony cases to misdemeanors and declined to prosecute 35% fewer felony cases compared to 2019. 
and his office requested bail in 20% fewer felony cases in 2022. Sadly, Bragg's approach has resulted in lower conviction rates for serious felony charges, with his office winning a conviction rate of just 51 percent. Miserable. And such cases brought in 2022, down from 68 percent in 2019. Even his misdemeanor convictions fell dramatically from 68 uh, percent in 2019 in his office to 29 percent under his jurisdiction in 2022. It is important to highlight that we must compare numbers to pre-pandemic levels about crime to get an accurate picture of crime in Manhattan and throughout the city. Moreover, while stats show that crime is still much higher than before the pandemic, they do not tell the entire story. Mentally ill homeless people verbally and physically attack people randomly on the streets and in the subway. Pharmacies lock up their products. The police officers feel, also feel pressured to undercharge perps they arrest. This is a daily reality in New York. To address these challenges, we need our state legislators and district attorneys to prioritize public safety and work together to strengthen our criminal justice system rather than weaken it. The state legislature has failed us by passing laws that have weakened our criminal justice system and enabled criminals to evade justice. Federal prosecutors could help put more career, uh, career criminals behind bars by charging the worst offenders with federal crimes instead of letting progressives like D.A. Bragg uh, bring prosecutions under weakened state laws. We are losing people by the tens of thousands to safer cities and states that offer a better quality of life. We must take swift action to ensure the safety and well-being of our communities. I applaud the House Judiciary Committee for examining the failed progressive policies in New York City and the refusal of DAs like Alvin Bragg to prosecute serious crimes. Public safety is paramount, and the committee should take an, the appropriate action to ensure that justice is served and our communities are protected. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Holden. Ms. Fi, uh, Ms. Fisher, Ms. Fisher, you, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, you may begin. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the House Judiciary Committee. My name is Rebecca Fisher, and I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, the only statewide gun violence prevention organization in New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As a leader of New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, I have devoted my career to reducing gun violence in this state. I care deeply about the safety and well-being of New Yorkers and work day in and day out to support and uplift victims and survivors of gun violence. I am committed to the safety of New Yorkers, not only because it is my job, but because I am a very proud resident of New York City and I am a parent raising my children here. Our team lives and works here also, and we all work with victims and survivors of gun violence and violence every day. We all want our city and our state to be as safe as it can be. We advocate for strong, sensible gun violence prevention laws and policies, and we also have a gun violence prevention education and victim service support program here in New York City public schools. Because New York State has strong leadership, we have some of the strongest gun violence prevention laws and programs in the country, and some of the lowest gun death and injury rates. New York ranks 47th lowest out of 50 states in gun violence rates. But New Yorkers are still being killed and injured by shootings each year, and that is because of the national gun trafficking crisis. The national gun trafficking crisis is largely the result of weak gun laws in other states and the fact that Congress has not enacted federal gun violence re prevention reforms. Crime guns are illegally trafficked from weak gun law states in the South along the I-95 corridor known as the Iron Pipeline. In New York State, we are the model for the nation on strong gun laws because it's not easy to acquire them here illegally. But states along the Iron Pipeline have extremely weak laws, and as a result, traffickers travel to these states to buy guns without a background check from reckless and rogue gun dealers. They then illegally bring them back to New York, sell them on our streets, and then illegal guns are used in crimes. From 2017 to 2021, 
New York City recovered and traced over 19,000 crime guns, and over 70% of those crime guns were originally purchased out of state from iron pipeline states. The guns are flowing into our most under-resourced neighborhoods, disproportionately impacting black and brown communities. Communities that need economic investment, affordable housing, better access to education and health care, and so much more. This is why we strongly support community-led initiatives that are evidence-based and trauma-informed, and they work, and also have our own school education and victim support program. Our school program, Reaction, provides social and emotional support to youth victims of gun violence, their families, and their schools. We partner with community violence intervention programs, local and national leaders and lawmakers, victim support organizations, and prosecutors and law enforcement. The COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 caused a national surge in gun violence across this country. However, as more resources are put back into the communities suffering the most, public safety circumstances are improving, including in New York City and Manhattan. In the last 12 months, according to NYPD's own data, as of April, shootings and murder are down in all five boroughs, including Manhattan. Crimes unrelated to guns are also going down in Manhattan and across the city. Yet, there is so much more that can be done by Congress to keep this city safe, because even one victim of gun violence is too many. Congress must close loopholes in the federal background check system, protect survivors of domestic violence, pass extreme risk protection order laws, pass safe storage laws, crack down on ghost guns, and hold rogue reckless gun dealers accountable. We need more investment in community violence intervention programs, and we need to hold the highest drivers of crime accountable. New Yorkers and all Americans, from Buffalo, New York, to Nashville, to last night's victims of the Dadeville, Alabama shooting, and every place in between, deserve to go to school, to the park, to their office, to a concert, to a grocery store, to their houses of worship, or to celebrate this nation's independence without the real and present danger of gun violence. Our children and our children's children have the right to be safe, and we need Congress, we need federal leadership to stand up and protect us. Thank you for inviting me to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Fisher. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Uh, uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, you, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. You may begin. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, you know, District Att Attorney Bragg took an oath to uphold the law and not to downgrade crimes that have an effect on victims of New York City. The, 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 the Detectives Endowment Association has been saying this for three years now, that a lot of the laws that have been enacted here in New York City and New York State are counterproductive to the safety of the people of New York City. The bail reform laws, there is a direct correlation from when the bail reform laws were enacted mm -hmm. to day one to the uptick in violent crimes across New York City. Sure. Shootings have increased. Gun violence has increased. Illegal guns coming into New York City has increased dramatically. But we talk about the seven majors, the felony crimes that are affecting people in New York City. But as important as those felony crimes that, that are uh, violating the people across this city are many low-level crimes that are not even being addressed that affect the victims for many, many years to come. Sexually related crimes on the subways and throughout the city streets are increasing. Assaults on police officers are increasing. I ask everyone in this room to think about your daughter, your wife, your grandmother, your sister, your aunt, riding on a subway train trying to get to work and being violated or groped just for that poor woman to try and prosecute this crime through the DA's office, and that crime is reduced to a disorderly conduct, which is no more than a traffic ticket. And that is going on every day 
in the borough of Manhattan every single day. And it's sad because many of the people in the borough of Manhattan, the ones that vote for D.A. Bragg, they live here, but many people come to Manhattan every day to work. Hundreds and thousands of people come into this city, into Manhattan to work, and don't have the opportunity to vote for the district attorney. But their safety is in jeopardy because of the district attorney. Now, you had police officer Mora and police officer Rivera were executed. Two young men were executed in the borough of Manhattan. And I strongly believe it was because of the memos that were put out by the district attorney's office that they were not going to enforce assaults on police officers, resisting arrests on police officers. And it sent a message to the criminal element that there are no consequences when you assault a police officer. Now, my concern is the safety of my detectives and the people who, who which we serve. And it's sad what's going on in this city because we have to start concentrating on the victims of crime and not the people that commit the crimes. You know, it's, it's, it's very sad when people are afraid to come out of their house at night in Upper Manhattan or Lower Manhattan and uh, when defunding the police was popular, the New York City Police Department had a homeless outreach unit that was very effective. It took these homeless people off the street, got them food, shelter, got them the medication or the help that they needed. And because of the defunding of the police, that unit was disbanded. And now when you walk through every neighborhood in Manhattan, there are homeless everywhere because they tied the hands of the police. Laws have been enacted to tie the hands of the police. Our city council in New York City enacted a law called the Diaphragm Compression Bill in which, in which you have a, a non-compliant individual fighting you and you can't put any pressure or f touch the person from the bottom of the neck to the top of the waist back and front. Now, I challenge anyone in this room to try and do that. It's impossible. But that law is enacted, and it's on the books. We also should have, back in the early 90s, late 80s, there was a, uh, a narcotics problem. They, enact, they, they appointed a special narcotics prosecutor. Because guns are so out of control now, we need to enact and appoint a special firearms prosecutor so everyone is on the same page in prosecuting gun-related crimes. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. DiGiacomo. Uh, we now recognize Mr. Uh, Mr. Borgen for, uh, for five minutes. I'd like, to begin, I'd like to begin by thanking Congressman Jim Jordan and the other members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify. Nearly two years ago, on May 20, 2021, I received a call no parent should ever receive. On the other hand, was my son Joseph who clearly told me he was okay but sad to be beaten out of Times Square. He was needing medical attention. He handed the phone to the NYPD who were extremely helpful and very supportive and did the best they possibly can. I was told they'd bring him to the emergency room in Bellevue Hospital. Without hesitation, I made a straight beeline straight to Manhattan, got in my car and drove to Manhattan. Um, I got to the hospital. It was hard to believe what my son looked like. His face was beaten. His, his, his face was sprayed with mace. They punched him. One fellow hit him with crutches, in Times Square, broad daylight, all because he's wearing a yarmulke going to a pro-Israel rally. Now, I'm in New York my whole life. I'm 57. Never had problems like this. It was just very shocking to hear this. Um, I, and it was just like horrible, horrible thing. My wife and I, my wife was at home. She couldn't come with me. It was COVID. Only one person go to the hospital. I sit in front of the community. Two year anniversary of the attack rap rapidly approaching. And the ongoing struggle with D.A. Bragg. This has been going on for two years. They have a f film of this in black and white from people on the street and Times Square. It's an open and shut case. And D.A. Bragg is just schlepping this case along with no solution, offering deal after deal. One fella, um, Wasim Awade, was, was, was hitting my son with crutch, was offered, an L, was offered a sweetheart deal, didn't take it yet. He was let out on probation. As he's getting out of the court, as, as, as he's getting out of jail, the friends are dancing with him, 
on his shoulder. He said, I would do this again. I would said, I would do this again. He had no, no qualms about doing it again, about being up another Jewish person. And in fact, while he was out on, on bail, he had an incident with a road rage with an elderly man on the street. Greg brought him in again, nothing. Just go out and behave yourself. This just emboldened him to act, and he doesn't care. I've been to three court hearings, and basically nothing has happened in three court hearings here in Lower Manhattan, a couple of buildings down. And it's just very disheartening that I sit here today and um, nothing is getting done. My son Joseph was invited to the White House to appear at, in front of Joe Biden, our president, and um, a bunch of Kamala Harris and so forth. And he, this was not a partisan issue. This is an issue where they were beating up Asians in New York nonstop, no repercussions. Beating up Jews, p putting, pushing people in the subways, in the tracks, no repercussions. It's just it's, it's hard to understand what goes on. And here this fellow is offered, one fellow is offered a deal, no jail time, he only punched my son once. This is what Bragg was offering to someone, hit my son once, okay, one time, okay, we'll give you a slap on her so you go and play video games for six months. It's just disgusting. Um, now, in the past couple of years since the, in accident, the incident happened, my son had uh, surgery on his wrist. He likes to play basketball, he's very uncomfortable to play basketball, and it's just, among other things, it affects his whole life. It's just, it's just a terrible, terrible thing. He has physical therapy three days a week, and these, these six individuals are walking the streets, roaming around, like nothing, not care in the world. And it's almost two years. I mean, unfortunately, down to Madeline, so it's four years. It's just, it's horrible. It's just, it, they're pushing plea bargains back before nothing gets done. Um, we have heard from, um, when my son got be, um, beaten up by these six individuals, we heard from many politicians. But um, I must quote, Mayor Adams was a candidate, Hoka, Governor Hoka, I must uh, uh, take notice with Mr. Nadler. You're a Jewish New Yorker. I called your office numerous times. I called Mr. Schumer's office, another Jewish New Yorker, numerous times. No one called us back. Neither one of you came out of statement on my son's incident. Okay? You're a Jewish New Yorker. You have Jewish roots here. At behavior like this enables D.A. Bragg to just do whatever he wants to do. If you guys would have come out with a statement from Washington that said we condemn anti this beating to Mr. Borg and son, we condemn anti said we condemn this act. Maybe Mr. Bragg would have taken this case a little more seriously, and I call you out on it, and, I'm, and most of my friends, I am so disheartened with you and Mr. Schumer, you don't understand. We wouldn't vote for Mr. Schumer again if we stood on our head. And if I lived in Manhattan, I wouldn't vote for you either. And I will tell you something else that bothers me. Everybody's here with gun control. Somehow the criminals can get guns. But the average person in New York can't get a gun. I just came back from Miami after two weeks. All my friends who moved out there, many, many of my friends, all have gun licenses. And there's a deterrent there. If someone goes after you, there's a chance that the person they're going to attack has a way to defend himself. Here in New York, we can't get guns. The criminals walk around shooting people and get guns nonstop. It's, just, it's unbelievable. And a gun charge comes to Mr. Bragg. Misdemeanor, no problem, walk the streets. I remember Plaxico Burris, if you remember, the New York Giants was a wide receiver. He was in a nightclub. The Giants were 10 and 1. He went to a nightclub, accidentally shot himself with a gun. I think Robin Morgenthau was a DA at the time. Plaxico Burris went to jail for 18 months, if you remember. He was a football star in New York. They needed him that they would run the Super Bowl again. Here in New York now, you come with a gun. Okay, d don't do it again. We'll see you, we'll see you again. It's just this disgusting, and it's a chutzpah what goes on. It's a Jewish word chutzpah. What goes on in this district, this, I haven't been in Manhattan for social events. I will not come for a restaurant. I will not come for, uh, to the garden for a ball game. I won't go to a Broadway show. I will not set foot in Manhattan. I have a friend of mine who likes to go to Broadway shows, matinees. You know what they do now? They get a group of 30 people. They get on a bus, park in front of the theater, walk into the theater. Don't walk around, no shopping. They then get on a bus, go to a predetermined restaurant, and they walk out to, to the restaurant, go on a bus, and go home. That's all the interaction I have in Manhattan. I would just like to say thank you for listening to me, and I hope some good comes from this. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. We, uh, pass along our, pa please pass along our best to your, uh, to your son. The, the chair would just ask the press. You, you can, we'll, we'll, we, plenty of opportunity to get all the pictures, all the whatever you want, but if you could just maybe stay back a little bit, particularly when the witnesses are testifying, I think that would, uh, the, just, just in appreciation of the witnesses taking time to be here, uh, that would be much appreciated by them. Uh, Mr. Kessler, you are recognized for your five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Nadler. Pull that, close, pull that mic close, Mr. Mr. Kessler. Uh, thank you to members of the committee um, and to fellow witnesses, some of whom have suffered the deepest and most unfair it's personal right. losses. And thank you to Kylie Murdoch, my research assistant, sitting behind me. But to members of the committee, I've got to ask, why are we here? Why are we in New York City? 
Yes, in this massive city of 8.5 million people piled atop each other on a speck of land barely 300 square miles in size, awful things happen, awful crimes happen, awful losses are suffered. But as unfortunate and tragic as it is, we live in a violent country like no other advanced nation, and the fact is that New York City is not only safer than most large cities in America, it is safer than most cities of any size, and on a per capita basis, New York City is safer than most of the states of the members sitting on the dais on the majority side. In 2020, for example, New York City's murder rate was 18 percent below the national average for the entire United States. Mr. Chairman, Ohio's murder rate was 59 percent higher than New York City's. Louisiana's murder rate was 251 percent higher than New York City's. The murder rate in Texas was 42 percent higher than New York City. South Carolina, 126 percent higher. Florida, 32 percent higher. Kentucky, 70 percent higher. North Carolina, 57 percent higher. Indiana, 72 percent higher. Arizona, 35 percent higher. Alabama, 119 percent higher. A hearing about the ravages of crime could be in Alabama with its towering homicide rate and a mass killing that just happened yesterday, or Louisville where five people were murdered in the blink of an eye at a downtown bank, or the murder capital of California, which is not Los Angeles or San Francisco or Oakland, but in Speaker McCarthy's district of Kern County with its county seat of Bakersfield, and it has been the murder capital of California for six years running. I'm focusing on the year 2020, but it's not, ju it's just, not, it's not just that one year. It's the entire century. From 2000 to 2020, if New York City was a state, its murder rate would rank smack dab in the middle at 22nd in the nation and be about one-fourth the murder rate of the entire state of Mississippi. And the borough of Manhattan is even safer than the rest of New York City. From 2000 to 2020, Manhattan's murder rate would rank 30th among the 50 states. I need to say a word about guns and about the politics of crime because A, 79 percent of homicides are by firearm, and B, I had both the pleasure and misfortune of working on the Mike Dukakis for President campaign, and I know how potent and irresistible the issue of crime is in politics. If someone is a victim of a gun crime in New York City, dollars to donuts that gun was not originally purchased in New York State. And I'll double down and bet that crime gun ori originated from either Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, or Virginia. There is massive gun trafficking that ferries guns from those five southern states with weak gun laws up I-95 to states like New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. And I know this because in 1996, I was working for a Brooklyn congressman from Park Slope named Chuck Schumer and we FOIA'd the FBI data for every gun in America that was recovered in a crime and, and successfully traced. And we uncovered gun trafficking patterns all across the nation. And practically nothing has been done legislatively ever since except to make it harder, much harder, to get ga data on the origin of crime guns. That brings me to the politics of crime. Wouldn't it be great if this hearing was about how illicit guns are trafficked to places like New York City, Newark, Boston, Philly, Chicago, and on and on, and how those guns terrorize the innocent people living in those places and elsewhere? <laughs> That's the sort of thing Congress would do if it really cared about what was happening with regard to crime in New York City. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Nadler, there are 8.5 million people living in New York City on this tiny plot of land. Bad things happen here no doubt. But the miracle of New York City is how well this enormous chunk of humanity mostly gets along and suffers less crime than much of the nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Um, we will now proceed with five-minute questioning. Uh, we're going to try to move through pretty quick and, like I said, stick to the five minutes with members. If any of our witnesses need a break, uh, water break, restroom break, just, just let us know and we'll, we'll do that. We can maybe go one at a time and keep going, or maybe we'll take a five-minute break just, just Signal us and let us know. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Miss Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today and being willing to share your stories with us. I served my community as a prosecutor and as a judge, and a prosecutor has an absolute responsibility to work with the men and women of law enforcement to uphold the law, 
to protect the community and to consult with crime victims and their families to be sure that their voices are heard in our criminal courts. When crimes aren't prosecuted and when judges are prevented from setting appropriate bail or when violent criminals are released out on the street and allowed to reoffend because of reckless bail policies, the criminal justice system is failing victims of crime. But it is not just my work as a prosecutor and as a judge that informs me for this hearing today. I am also a mother. And we need to begin this hearing today by remembering that the victims of these soft on crime policies, the victims of these reckless bail reform policies aren't just numbers. They are people and lives that are forever harmed or lost. Each of them reflects a failure in our criminal justice system. With that, Ms. Brame, I would like to return to your story. Would you please begin by sharing with us a little bit more about your son? Excuse me, is that the way my son was murdered or my son as a person? As a person, please. Um, Sergeant Hassan is the oldest of my five. Um, he was 35 years old at the time of his death. He is a father of three small children, Jason, Jordan, and Jelani, my three grands. And also, um, Hassan was a husband. Um, he was an amazing young man. He was a personal physical trainer at Crunch Gym at the time of his murder. He was also a full-time student at Manhattan College. Hassan was a responsible, licensed, and registered gun owner, all right? He was a good guy with a gun. Do you believe that the criminals who murdered your son received justice? That the criminals who murdered him? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely not. You know, even the stabber, they offered him a plea deal. Instead of the 25 to life, they gave, he copped out to 20 years, okay? Um, the brother is the only, the other brother is the only one who actually went to trial, and he blew trial, he lost trial, and he also got 20 to life, all right? And so, but two of the other defendants got completely away with what they did to my son. If you take a life, you do life, okay? There should be no plea deals for murder. And what Those cases your... need to be brought to trial. And what about your family, Ms. Brain? Do you feel your family was treated appropriately in the criminal justice system? Absolutely not. We were treated like garbage. Tell me about that. We got no answers. If it wasn't for my persistence, all right, if it wasn't for my not missing one court date, except for the one where they dropped the murder and gang assault charge against Mary Saunders because Alvin Bragg's office did not inform me that they were doing that, which is my right to know that. I didn't give a t get a chance to give my victim impact statement when they sentenced her, her to that one year time served. Okay, so they treated us like garbage. They didn't reveal any information. I had to do a lot of research myself. That's one of the reasons why I formed my Victim Rights Reform Council, be to help other you know, uh, brothers and families of homicide victims to help them navigate that court system because we got no services. There is no services in New York City for victims. If there is, I have no idea what they are. Thank you, ma'am. Councilman Holden, you've called for legislation that would give judges more discretion when setting bail conditions for defendants who may pose a threat to public safety. Would you tell us a bit more about your proposals and why you believe they are important? Well, New York State is the only state in the union that a judge cannot consider this, the, how dangerous um, the defendant is. So if he's committed a number of crimes before, the judge can't consider that. The only state in the union. So that's why you have repeat offenders out on the streets. This is so ridiculous, so absurd, that a judge cannot consider how dangerous an individual is who was arrested 
And that's why people are walking. And so we, we've made proposals to, the, to our state uh, colleagues. Let's change this. Thanks. Why are we the only state in the time union that does this? I mean, you have to question that. Time to, time but to again, go. so many people doing this. Time of the gentlewoman has expired. Thank you, Mr. Holden. We'll, 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 we'll sure you have, you'll get more time. The okay. chair now recognizes the ranking member from New York, Mr. Natter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Brame, you uh, failed to note that as a result of D.A. Bragg's prosecution, two men are currently serving life sentences for the murder of your son. Mr. Uh, Kessler, in your testimony, you noted that New York City is safer than most cities and even most states in America. The police department's own data show that since D.A. Bragg took office, shootings in Manhattan have declined by 20 percent, homicides have declined by 16 percent, and the rates, rates of virtually every other type of violent crime are lower during the first quarter of this year than they were at this time last year. In the meantime, homicide rates in places such as Ohio, Louisiana, Texas, and Arizona are much higher than in New York. As someone who studies crime trends, what do you think accounts for this disparity in safety between Manhattan and other parts of the United States? Thank you, Mr. Nadler. Um, so I don't think any place in this country is really safe, okay, because we're, we're awash in guns. New York is safer, and it's, on average, New York City is safer than Ohio, Texas, many other places. I think number one is gun ownership rates, okay? So gun ownership rates in red states tend to be about twice the gun ownership rates in blue states. There are other factors as well. Poverty rates are, uh, matter. Um, uh, educational attainment is often a correlation with crime. And I also think that in certain states, cities in those states are starved for resources because frankly, the governors don't really care about getting votes in those states. And so I think some of the urban areas in southern states, the, the amount of police that they have per capita is far less than in places like New York City um, and all the resources for schools and after-school programs. But I think number one is gun ownership rates. Thank you. How does New York City's murder rate compare to the national average? New York City's murder rate is uh, 18 percent below the national average, and I believe has been below the national average every single year since 2010, maybe, and I think several years be before that, between 2000 and 2010. How about assault? Uh, the assault rates are lower. And burglary? Uh, burglary rates are lower. Larceny? Lower. And rape? Lower. And how do the incidents of those crimes in New York City compare to the national average? In all of those cases, New York City's rates are, are lower. How does New York City's murder rate compare to that of Ohio? New York City's murder rate in 2020, oh, I should say Ohio's murder rate in 2020 was 59 percent higher than New York City's. And what about the rate of rape in Ohio compared to New York? The rate of rape in Ohio was 280 percent higher. than in New York. And assault? 34 percent higher. And burglary? 146 percent higher. And larceny? Uh, 346 percent higher. Than in New York. Than How in do New the York incidence City. rates of those crimes in New York City compare to the national averages? Okay. New York City's murder rate is 18 percent below the national average. Rate of rape, 58 percent lower. Rate of robbery, rate of robbery is 102 percent higher. Rate of assault, 16 percent lower. Rate of burglary, 44 percent lower. Rate of larceny, 71 percent lower. Rate of motor theft, 58 percent lower. So lower on six out of the seven. Now let's talk specifically about violent crime. Based on your review of crime data, does New York have a higher or lower rate of violent crime than Florida? Lower. And what about Louisiana? Lower. Kentucky? Lower. Arizona? Lower. North Carolina? Lower. If you were able to decide or given a choice of where to hold a hearing about violent crime in America, what are, the ci some, what are some of the cities or states where you think a hearing would be most needed and most effective and why? Well, I think you could certainly hold hearings in places like, you know, Louisville very high rates, Jacksonville, very high crime rates there. Um, I mean, there's a lot of Alabama, Mississippi, extraordinarily high murder rates in those states, some in cities, some not in cities. You know, there's, New York City is 
Look, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in the city because there's eight and a half million people here. But relative to the rest of the country, it's doing better. And finally, according to CDC data, the states with the highest rates of gun deaths are Mississippi, Louisiana, Wyoming, Missouri, Alabama, and Alaska. What trends are you seeing with respect to gun violence generally in red states? What we found when we looked at between 2000 and 2020 is the murder rate in red states as defined by the 25 states that voted for Donald Trump in 2020 versus the 25 states that voted for Joe Biden, the murder rate in red states was higher than the murder rate in blue states in all 21 of those years. And over a cumulative 21-year period, it was 23 percent higher in those red states. And even if you took out the largest blue city in each of the red states, the murder rate was 12 percent higher in those states. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, parliamentary you inquiry. Mr. Chairman, my parliamentary inquiry is in light of the testimony you just heard, what is the mechanism for the committee to transfer this hearing to Ohio where the crime rate is significantly greater than here in New York? Is there a, a motion? Not a parliamentary inquiry. It is about, I'm asking parliamentary, how do we move the venue so we can have a hearing in a city or state that has a serious par crime problem, the state of Ohio? Not a, not a proper state of parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman's time is expired. Appeal the ruling of the chair. Not appealable uh, um, uh, ruling. Mr. Mr. Jordan, I'm, I'm sorry. If Mr. Nadler is going to make derogatory comments towards the mother of a homicide victim, he could at least allow General, her some time to respond. The lady is not recognized. Hang on. The committee will be in order. The committee will be in order. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Pursuant to what you just said, uh, I think it is important that you have an opportunity to respond to the statement by the ranking member that you, uh, justice was served in the case of your loss. Ms. Blaine. Sergeant Hassan Kareem is dead forever. Dead forever. There are four people directly responsible for his murder. Two people is not justice. And until there is justice for the murder of my son, there will be no peace. None. All four, I'm asking for a special prosecutor to reopen those murder and gang assault charges against Mary Stewart, Mary Saunders, and Travis Stewart. Present that evidence, present that video to a jury and allow them to decide those homicidal maniacs, innocents, or guilt. My son is dead forever. They deserve to be in prison forever. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Ms. Harrison, uh, there's been a lot of discussion at the end of the day uh, about gun violence, gun violence, gun violence. Uh, all three of you at that end, were there guns involved in, in the murder? No, there were not. Um, Madeline's son was stabbed, and my boyfriend and his best friend were both stabbed. So, knives kill. There's a will, there's a way, and when well, evil far. wants to attack, evil is going to attack. And I would also like to say that, you know, New York might have strict gun laws, but we also have conflicting gun laws, which I haven't heard from uh, Ms. Fisher, uh, regarding raise the age. Uh, Immediately after the Buffalo incident, Kathy Hochul implemented a raise the age that, imp that placed a ban on bu purchasing weapons, f certain weapons for minors. But we also have a, an original raise the age law that conflicts that completely because it eliminates the criminal prosecution of anyone, any minor holding an illegal weapon. And in this state, you have a universal assault weapons ban and have for a long time. Isn't that true? I'm not sure about the assault weapons ban, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, and Mr. Alba, I, I think your testimony was very powerful. You, you too were attacked by other than a gun, isn't that correct? And if you'd pause the clock. Yes, correct. Uh, I'm yes, sorry, correct. I can't hear you. There was you. no gun involved. And uh, your, uh, uh, your response that saved your life was also not a gun. Is that correct? Well, I, I appreciate the fact that you were able to respond. Uh, in New York, 
if I understand correctly, even though you were uh, operating a, a, a store, you were not allowed to have a weapon to protect yourself in the way of a gun. Is that correct? And I'd like to yeah, – yeah. Go ahead. Can, can you please repeat the question? Yes. In New York, you, uh, you defended yourself with a knife because as a store operator, you were not allowed to have a gun. Is that correct? Okay. But you didn't have – you don't own a gun. Is that correct? Yeah, he doesn't own a gun. He doesn't really know much. Okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, I think, Mr. Holden, you probably could answer this. Uh, the uh, According to the figures we were given earlier, uh, at least 6,000 of the 19,000 weapons were uh, New York-based weapons. Uh, is it true that, that guns go missing and get stolen and get straw purchased here in New York in spite of the most stringent laws in the, in the country? Exactly. You're, you're not going to get every gun off the street. The iron pipeline is a problem. We know that. But a lot of guns come from New York City. A lot of guns are made in New York City, put together in New York City. Um, the, the, the problem we have in New York State, in New York City, is we have some of the toughest gun laws in the nation, but they don't enforce them. The courts are not enforcing them. The DAs are not enforcing them. So this is a big problem. You have multiple shootings, one individual, five uh, arrests for shootings, and he's at back on the street. Well, and to how, Mr. how is that working? Yeah, and Mr. Giacomo, you uh, you represent so many of our brave men and women in blue. Uh, can you comment on that failure to enforce existing laws leading to the kind of both gun and non-gun violence that New well, York is seeing? You know, uh, like we said earlier, it was brought out in the hearing uh, that uh, New York City police and detectives took. It and, uh, you know, amazing amount of firearms off the streets. Uh, and every time they do that, they put their life in harm's way. They, they confront an armed felon, and they put their life in harm's way just for that individual to walk out the door the next day and, again, get a firearm and use it either in a robbery or in, uh, in a, a gang-related uh, violence. And, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to take all the time that was, should have been paused but I do want to comment that uh, a lot has been made about moving the venue or other places we could be. And I will reiterate on behalf of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, yes, we could be having this in Los Angeles. Yes, we could be having it in San Francisco. There are other places around the country in which systematically district attorneys are not enforcing the laws and leading to the kind of terrible stories we're hearing here today. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Lofgren, is recognized. Uh Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I do think um, that there is a reason why we're in this jurisdiction. But first, let me just say, all of us on this committee, no matter our party, are opposed to crime. And all of us have sympathy for victims of crime. But I will say also that we don't have jurisdiction. The federal government does not have jurisdiction over state and local prosecutions. That's up to the voters of each state and each locality. But if we were going to have a hearing that we have no jurisdiction to deal with, I think we might go to uh, a place in the Speaker's District, uh, which has much higher crime rates than New York City. As has been mentioned, uh, Bakersfield has a homicide rate of 13.7 uh, Per, percent per 1,000, 100,000 people, New York is at 5.5 for the same amount of residents. And I'll note also that 100 percent of the fatal officer-involved shootings involved a gun. Um, and, you know, the, Mr. Jordan, in his opening statement, mentioned his sympathy for the police. We all have that. I also have sympathy for the officers who defend us, defended us against a MAGA mob. Uh, unlike some members on the other side of the aisle. I think it's pretty obvious that we're in New York uh, because of the case of New York versus Donald uh, J. Trump. But I'm also worried that we're not here 
about guns because 80% of all the murders in the U.S. are committed with a gun. We had 150 mass shootings so far this year. Our, our, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have prevented any kind of sensible gun violence legislation from passing to keep us safe. Now, you know, we're not the only country in the world uh, with people who want to do bad things or with uh, people who are unstable, but we're, only, we're the only country in the world that has mass shootings practically every other day. And that is something that's within our jurisdiction and we ought to take some action. This is a choice that we are making to allow all the children of America to go into school worried that they're going to be the victim of a mass shooting. And it's a scandal that we have done nothing about it. Now, um, talking about the people versus Donald J. Trump, we don't have jurisdiction over that either. Uh, that's something that is a local prosecution, and it's entirely improper for the federal government or any committee of the United States to try and interfere in, in this matter. So having said that, I want to talk a little bit more about, or ask a little bit more, about um, gun violence and what can be done about it. Um, Ms. Fisher, it's been suggested, or Mr. Kessler, either of you, that somehow having more guns would make us safer. Did the statistics actually back that up, that having more guns makes for a safer community? States with strong gun laws have lower rates of gun violence. And one of the things that's important to say here is that crime is going down in New York City, thankfully. But there is more that can be done by Congress to enact strong universal background checks, a strong extreme risk protection order law at the federal level and to fund state laws. There's more that can be done to enact safe storage laws and to combat the trafficking crisis. And Congress is standing idly, idly by and not doing anything. Let me ask you about some of our colleagues have suggested that we defund uh, the prosecutor's office here in Manhattan. It's my understanding that the majority of the funds comes uh, from an annual grant uh, to the office's witness aid services unit um, that provides um, services to victims of crime. What would the impact be of eliminating those services if, if you know Ms. Kessler? Or Ms. Fisher? Ms. Fisher. Sure. We need to be investing and putting more resources into victim services and supporting victims. As you heard here today, we need to be giving victims more mental health support, more social support. We need to be helping them um, find access to compensation, not only for funeral expenses, for hospital expenses, to make up for um, lost income. Let, let me just say, I want to thank all the witnesses, including the, the victims of crime. I fear that you are being used for a political purpose despite your, your sincerity. Gentlelady's time has expired. The, the, the committee, will be in, committee will be in order. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, is recognized for five minutes. Our criminal justice system is insane. It's dangerous. It's harmful. And it is destroying the fabric of our city. Time and again, our police officers make an arrest. And then the person who is arrested for assault felonious assault, robberies, and gun possession, they're finding themselves back on the street within days, if not hours, after arrest. Eric Adams, New York mayor. My friends, the reason we are here in New York is because you have Democrats, you have citizens calling for some relief from this pain. And we are here not to use anyone, but to uplift mm -hmm. the voices of brave people who are here to tell their story. Ms. Brame, do you feel used in this hearing? Gentleman is recognized. Ms. Brame, do you feel used? Absolutely not. Ms. I'm Harrison? A, I'm a willing participant. Ms. Harrison, do you feel used? Tell you what, let me ask you this way. Do you feel more used by this committee hearing, or do you feel more used by a criminal justice system that allowed people to kill people that you love and care about 
with no consequence. The latter, and I'm beyond grateful for the opportunity to testify here be on behalf of victims because the Democrat Party, including Mr. Nadler and everybody here today, has ignored us in this city. And we need federal oversight. We need help. We're not getting well, any kind of help. And I, the services that she wants to keep funding are not being provided to the victims. I have a woman sitting outside who is a victim of domestic violence who was conned by an immigrant, and she is receiving no services whatsoever. So until we get an, a thorough audit to the outcomes of the services being provided, no. We need, we need to find out what's going wrong and get the services to where they need to be. I am not here to criticize any New Yorkers except maybe one, and that's because so many New Yorkers will soon become Florida voters. <laughs> this is an iconic city. It's actually our nation's most iconic mm -hmm. city. And it's not because of the beautiful architecture, and it's not because of the geography. It is because the sense of hustle that is so inherent to the people who come to New York to achieve their dreams. And increasingly, that hustle is being replaced with fear. Uh, uh, Mr. Holt, Councilman Holden, you and I are from different parties. If we talked about a thousand things, we'd probably disagree about a vast majority of them. But here's my simple question for you. Is fear a rising feature of life in New York, or is fear a declining feature of life in New York? It, it is um, increasingly worrisome what we're going through in New York City. Fear is an everyday event in New York City. Taking the subway. My wife is Asian American. She will not get on the New York City subway. My daughter will not get on a New York City subway for fear because many Asian Americans have been attacked. But Mr. Kessler says there's just a lot of people here in Manhattan. You just have to take it. You right. just have to understand that this is going to be a violent place. Which I found, I found that insulting. Uh, well, Mr. DiGiacomo, you're here as the voice of, of law enforcement in, in many ways. And since the days of Cain and Abel, there has constantly been a violent criminal element as some feature of American society. And the lives we all get to live are lashed to whether or not we put that violent criminal element in charge or whether or not we constrain it for the sake of people who want freedom. And so my question for you is when the day one memo of Alvin Bragg changes the way resisting arrest is treated so people can resist arrest against law enforcement and not uh, actually face a consequence for that. What does that do to the enterprise of policing? Well, it makes the, uh, the officers and the detectives on the street their job that much harder. Uh, everything becomes confrontational or physical, and they put themselves, the police officers and detectives, are in harm's way. Well, now, we, we don't want to do that, but I have only, only a moment left, and I have to address this matter of, of crime rates that my colleagues keep talking about. And to the extent that there is an impact on crime rates in major cities, I would suggest that that is exactly what you get with the Sorosization of the United States justice system. And in places like New Orleans, Louisiana, in places like Tampa, Florida, in Jacksonville, Florida, in Tucson, Arizona, increasingly George Soros is putting in upwards of $40 million to elect 75 uh, DAs to be able to engage in these downgrades. And by the way, not only are they downgrading the violent things, they can't even win the cases they try. Mr. Holden, you pointed out the fact that Alvin Bragg is actually terrible at losing in court. And since I don't have time, I would ask you for the record, since he keeps losing all of his cases, we might opine as to why, and we might seek a better utilization of the federal resources that we provide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Well Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Let me um, indicate I abhor crime. I abhor victimization, the victims that suffer. I want to prevent crime. I want to pay tribute to all of the law enforcement in this room and outside and those in Houston, Texas, from where I come from, of which I have a deep and abiding affection and relationship with. As a Democrat, I will not sit here, as my predecessor said, Barbara Jordan, and see the demonization of the Constitution, the destruction of what we believe in and our values. I want to stand here and be supportive of everyone who is before us, but I want to do it in a way that is befitting the patriotism of this nation, the very soldiers that are on front lines wearing uniforms with people of color and otherwise. I abhor anti-Semitism, if you will. I abhor people being violated through domestic violence, and it was Democrats 
who fought extensively for the Violence Against Women Act, which has put a lot of money in the state of New York and other states. Let us work together. Let us find facts that really address this question. And that is what I'm going to try to do. First, I think it is important to note that the monies that the Republicans want to cut are monies that would help victims. We don't want victims, but we need to have resources. My own crime victims in Houston say, we are lonely. We need to be taken care of after the incident. And I agree, and I brought money to the Houston Police Department. Let me ask Ms. Vaughn, there are many things that we can do better. Excuse me, Ms. Fisher. There are many things that we can do better. Uh, and I'd clearly like you to talk about the importance of a storage bill. I've introduced the Kimberly Vaughn Safe Storage Act. What does that do in terms of bringing down gun violence? Thank and you, my time is short, so I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Representative. We need safe storage laws to ensure that children can't access guns that shouldn't have them, to ensure that individuals who are in crisis can't access them and potentially commit suicide and mass shootings. Safe storage laws work. We have a strong one here in New York State, and Congress should enact one as well. And can I just ask a yes or no? Are mandatory red flag laws good? Yes. Are, should we rush to Washington and implement a ban the assault weapons? Yes. And can we do better in passing stronger gun safety legislation? We know we've had one bill, but can we do better? We absolutely can do better, and we need comprehensive reform, and we need it urgently for all Americans. Uh, Mr. Kessler, can you quickly respond to the question of violence? Have you, can you, under oath as you've taken, affirm that violence or gun violence in a, a myriad of ways is going down in this state? I just want to hear you say it again. Yeah, it is uh, absolutely true, and it's um, it's also 18 percent below the the national average in New York City. And New York State has a far lower murder rate than the uh, country as a whole. Quickly, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Fisher. What percentage of guns are found in New York come from other places? Over 70 percent of guns that are used in crimes in New York City and across New York State come from out of state the iron pipeline from weak gun law states, including Florida and the Carolinas and Georgia. Let me ask uh, uh, the council member Holden, thank you for your service. You said you're a lifelong New Yorker? That's correct. Uh, and um, you therefore lived in New York in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and so yes. on? Yep. Um, did you um, say in an article recently, I've never seen the lawlessness we're seeing now? Yep. And so uh, do you realize and recognize this pamphlet, Fear City, in the 1970s? Uh, and so apparently we've had some ups and downs. This is Fear City, uh, a survival guide for visitors in the city of New York by NYPD, 1975. I ask unanimous consent to put this in the record. Without objection. And so um, we've had our moments. We do better if we work together rather than we cast about what is bad and what isn't. Let's work together. Let's get the puns. Let's get the appropriate justice for these victims. Let me quickly go to this point. We are here wrongly because you're here rightly. You are here rightly. But we're here wrongly because District Attorney Bragg, because of Trump, has been called, he called him, a Soros-backed animal, a dog whistle. And then, of course, other Republicans have followed likely. By the way, Republicans have threatened to defund the ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm, that does a lot on trafficking. This office, because of these threats, white powder has come. He's had threatening and racially charged calls into the district attorney. I indicated to you my belief and love in democracy. I want justice for you. But this is an absurd and poor reflection of who we are as Americans, who I am as a Houstonian. And I believe in bringing people together. We need to bring people together and work on the solutions. I ask unanimous consent to place in the record. Three are charged with selling ghost guns, without including objection. assault weapons. Without I'm objection. asking unanimous consent. Yeah, without objection. And the welcome to Fear City, unanimous without, consent. Without objection. Uh, with that, I yield back. I thank you, and I thank the witnesses out of the bottom General, of my heart. General lady yields back. Chair, Chair, Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Holden, you were born in New York City? Yes. You were raised in New York City, went to grade school and high school here in the city? Yep. Went to college in New York City. You got, yes. I, think, I think I looked. You got an associate degree, an undergrad degree, postgrad degree, all from universities here in New York City. Is that right? Yes, I did, Chair. You're a professor at a university here in New York City? Right. 44 years. All your professional career has been, sent, uh, been spent here in New York City. Is that right? Yes. And you received a Lifetime Achievement Award for your volunteer work 
from the Queen Civic Group. Is that yeah. right? For yes. your work here in the city. Yes. You love this town, don't you? I love it. I mean, I think, I think Mr. Gates is right. I think America loves this town. Right. Whether you're a Yankees fan, a Mets fan, a Giants fan, a Jets fan. We the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, Broadway, Wall Street. Americans love this city. Maybe most, I think, Americans appreciate the people of this town and the example they showed the country after that tragic day of 9-11. Right. Do you agree with all that, Mr. Holden? I agree with that 100%. Yeah. But right now, the policies being implemented by this district attorney are going to ruin this great city. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. It's scary, isn't it? It's scary what you see. It's scary what Ms. Harrison's had to endure, what Mr. Albus had to endure, what Ms. Brames had to endure, and what Mr. Borgen has had to endure. And it's driven by that day one memo. That day one memo which sent a message to this town, to the bad guys in this town, you can do bad things and you're not going to get prosecuted. Do you agree with all that, Mr. Holden? Yes, I do. Yeah, it's scary. Soft on crime policies are going to ruin this great city. And that's why we're here. It's happened in other cities, as Mr. Gates pointed out. That's why we're going to – this is not the only hearing. We're going to have other hearings. We'll go to wherever, wherever we need to go. But this is something that has to happen, has to stop. Justice isn't supposed to be political. Now, Mr. Holden, you're a Democrat, right? Yes, I am. But it shouldn't matter. Republican or Democrat, I think, as a lot of people have said, it should not matter, should it? What's the answer, Mr. Holden? What would you uh, recommend? My allegiance is to my constituents. I, and I live well here. For 71 years, I've lived in New York City. I've seen bad times, high crime, 2,000 murders a year in the 80s. I've not seen the lawlessness that I'm seeing today in New York City in my lifetime. That means we're afraid to go anywhere. There's Let me just be clear. So, I want to just, so in 71 years, your life here in this great city, it's never been as bad as it is today. And I, I've had so many friends leaving this town because they, they just see the quality of life dropping. They go out on the street. There's people driving down the wrong way uh, with electric scooters. There's people robbing stores. You know that all the yeah. pharmacies in New York City have to be under lock and key. They, they, you have to go in a case. It's so bad, these, these small crimes, that Mr. Bragg has said he's not going to prosecute. You don't send that message out there. You don't, and that's why we disagree. We're the same party, but we totally disagree on that. I am, again, my allegiance is not to the party. It's to my constituents and where I live. And, and again, I, I plan to live here you know, until I die. But I don't want to see you go down the drain. Yeah. You're standing up for the folks you get to represent in Queens as part of the city council. Mr. Borgen, Ms. Fisher earlier said bad guys go into other states and buy guns illegally. And the Democrats' response is take away guns from law-abiding citizens. Is that going to work, Mr. Borgen? Absolutely not. I just want to say one thing. You know, I, I sit here and listen. You're on one side. You're on one side. When Ronald Reagan was president, him, him and Tip O'Neill had regular meetings got together and worked together right. in Congress. That's right. I, I don't understand why I have to sit here, whether Republican or Democrat, I'm a Republican, by the way. I, I now vote in Florida, and I'm a registered voter in Florida. I have a Florida driver's license. Based on, I'm not playing this state, but the fact of the matter is, if everybody would work together and not sit here and say, um, this party says this about Trump, about this, it's just, it, it doesn't make any sense. But the fact of the matter is, the criminals will get guns either way. You can do whatever you want. The criminals are going to get guns. They always, they always have gotten guns. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. So you can sit here till take, till your face blue in the face. You can say Congress are going to outlaw gun sales across America. They're going to get guns. Yep. The criminals will get guns. And there's nothing you can do about it. Just, that's life. Always. And Mr. Kessler sits here and says, we have to sit and take it. I never heard someone say to me, you have to take crime. I live in Long Island. Crime has now come to my area on the, out in the five towns in a, in a very nice su suburban area. We have had robberies now in stores. And now the crime is coming toward me because I guess New York City's tapped out. They can't rob the pharmacies anymore. But it's just, it's a, they're clearly going to get guns. Nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. Bad guys aren't necessarily stupid. They're just bad. They're, they're going to figure bad. out they, a way to do bad they're, things. They're, and the key is to put bad guys behind bars so they can't harm others. And when you send that message, things get better. In a segment of society, there are always going to be criminals. It's been from day one. Nothing you can do about it. But if Mr. If, if Mr. Bragg would lock people up, it would save a lot of headaches in New York City and save lives. Thank you, Mr. Borgen. Gentlemen, the, 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 the chair now recognizes the order. gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a sham hearing. It's not about crime in New York. It's an effort 
to impede and ultimately suppress the prosecution of Donald Trump. And if you don't believe it, then all you need to do is connect the dots. First, Manhattan District Attorney Bragg announced his criminal charges against ex-President Trump. Then, House Judiciary Republicans abused their power by subpoenaing testimony and records from D.A. Bragg about the ongoing prosecution. And next, they bring this sham hearing to Manhattan, supposedly about crime. But if my colleagues across the aisle were really concerned and really cared about reducing violent crime, they'd work with Democrats to pass common sense gun laws. There are too many gun deaths in this country, and that's why I have joined with my fellow Democrats to co-sponsor bills that would ban assault weapons, strengthen background checks, and fund research into gun violence prevention. Meanwhile, MAGA Republicans continue to resist even the most basic reforms like universal background checks. If Republicans really wanted to stop violent crime, they would be in D.C. right now, working with Democrats to pass common sense gun legislation. Instead, like jackbooted thugs, they've descended on New York City using violent crime as their pretext. The MAGA Republican extremists are not interested in gun violence or even knife violence. The Republican witnesses who have used their time to criticize District Attorney Bragg have served as props in a MAGA Broadway production. The real purpose in coming to New York City. Can we have order? Purpose, hey. The real purpose hey. in coming Gentlemen to New York suspend. City. Gentlemen, we'll suspend. Stop the clock. Gentlemen, we'll suspend. I've, for the audience, I've said several times now that the committee has to be in order. If, if anyone continues, then we're going to have to escort some people out. Please don't talk uh, that. So please don't talk down to us, witnesses. Please. Yep. The gentleman, the gentleman from Georgia controls the time. Mr. Johnson, you can proceed. The real purpose in coming to New York City is to harass, intimidate, and threaten Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. We are here because Manhattan District Attorney Bragg announced the indictment of former President Trump. And MAGA United States House Republicans have responded by using their power to try to help ex-President Trump beat the 34 counts of fraud that he has been charged with. MAGA Republican extremists have defended the January 6th insurrectionist, and they are out here today serving as Trump's bulldogs trying to scare a duly elected district attorney from following the facts where they lead and enforcing the law. It is just one more sign that MAGA Republicans are a clear and present danger to our democracy and are actively working to undermine the rule of law, not just federally, but also on the state and local levels. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from New York's 18th District, uh, the Honorable Congressman uh, Adriano Espaillat. Gentlemen, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member, and thank you. Uh, my colleague uh, Hank uh, Johnson for yielding time. Mr. Chairman, um, first I want to uh, express my condolences, my deepest condolences to both Ms. Harrison and Ms. Brain and Mr. Alba. Uh, I was proud to see your community, our community, rally around you and, and other bodegueros, and I applauded uh, DA Bragg's decision to drop the charges against you. Uh, during the 80s and 90s before I was involved in public service um, as a regular citizen of New York. I fought crime and drugs during the crack wars yes. in northern Manhattan. Yes. During those years, the 34 precincts used to average over 100 homicides. Let me, re let me repeat this, over 100 homicides yes. a year. Myself and my family members were held at gunpoint during those years. Held up at gunpoint. I don't know if any of you here have been held up at gunpoint. This is deeply personal to me. This year, the 34th Precinct has witnessed 
zero homicides. Mm. And last year, although far too many, the, that same precinct in northern Manhattan witnessed five homicides. From 100 to five and to this year, zero. Yes. But let me say something to you, Mr. Chairman. The common denominator in most homicides across the country is a gun. It's a gun. Eighty percent of the homicides committee, in this country are committed by guns. Gentlemen, gentlemen. A young man, a young man murdered the on 130th Street. A gentlemen, man murdered on 137th Street. A gun. The gentleman from Georgia and yields back. And you guys brandish your paints with AR-15. Reprehensible. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by quoting a short excerpt from an important study and legal memorandum that was issued in November by the Heritage Foundation. Listen to this. It's entitled, The Blue City Murder Problem. And this summary statement is a message to all gentleman Americans. Gentlemen, suspend for just a second. I would ask, I would ask that, that we, the audience be quiet. The gentleman from Louisiana controls the time. If we could stop press, but the press would please move so we can conduct the hearing. We move, move aside. Capitol Police, if you, can, if you could help us just clear that out. The press will be given ample opportunity to talk to folks. We need to, we need to clear out and be quiet during the, quiet during the hearing. Okay. Committee will be in order. Gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Here's the quote. Your public safety as a resident is dramatically impacted by your district attorney and whether he or she is a George Soros funded rogue prosecutor or a law and order prosecutor by your police department and by whether lo the local politicians support and adequately fund the police and prosecutors offices. It goes on. This is why the Soros rogue prosecutor movement has concentrated its fire at identifying, recruiting, and funding candidates for local district attorney races by elevating pro-criminal and anti-victim zealots into office the rogue prosecutor movement destabilizes the safety of our communities, mm -hmm. treats criminals as victims and police as the criminals, and ignores real victims. America's sky-high murder rates, for example, are almost exclusively cabined in cities run by Democrats and with Democrat district attorneys, many of whom are bought and paid for by George Soros. Why are we beginning our crime wave field hearings in New York City? Because this is one of the most egregious examples in America. Alvin Bragg is the poster child for exactly what was just described. Uh, Ms. Brame, I want to thank you for your uh, compelling testimony today and uh, sharing the shocking and tragic story of your son, uh, Sergeant Hassan Korea's gang assault and vicious murder by four criminals he did not know. In your written uh, statement submitted today, you wrote this. You said, quote, D.A. Bragg has demonstrated over and over again that he has no regard or concern for human life or victims of crime by instituting his ADAs to not prosecute violent recidivists and ultimately release them back to the streets to victimize and terrorize more innocent New Yorkers, unquote. Uh, you heard Mr. Nadler and Mr. Kessler and others share their manipulated statistics this morning, suggesting that New York City is, quote, one of the safest big cities in America. Mm -hmm. But uh, you and other, Nor uh, other New Yorkers don't agree with that, I know. Mr. Holden just said uh, our people are afraid to go anywhere because this is the worst lawlessness in the city's history. How do you respond to these claims that this is just a magical, safe city right now? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> I think that the average New Yorker doesn't care nothing about no statistics, okay, especially in the black and brown communities. We care about the mothers who have to visit the morgue to identify their dead child's body. We care about the mothers who have to lean into the coffin and watch them lower that top down on that child and they know they'll never see them again. We care about being able to let our child go out to the park and play without getting shot in the stroller. We care about not getting raped in elevators. We don't care nothing about your statistics. You cannot convince us to not believe our lying eyes with your numbers, all right? Because we see it with our very eyes, day in and day out, especially in the poor black and brown communities where none of you in this room would even step foot in. Ms. Brame, you're, you're so right. 
and they're changing the subject. They're doing their best to change the subject here and obscure mm -hmm. the facts because the facts are difficult for them to face. The objective fact is that Manhattan has instituted pro-crime anti-victim policies that have resulted in an increase in violent crime and created this dangerous situation in the community. And, and one, America's once great cities that was the symbol of freedom and opportunity and liberty. Mm -hmm. According to the NYPD data, New York City saw a 23% surge in major crimes in one year mm -hmm. since Alvin Bragg took over. That is the fact. We have a violent crime epidemic here, and everybody in America knows it because we see the videos played mm -hmm. out on our television, mm -hmm. local news, every single night of what's going on here in the city. I just want to say this, and I, I'm almost out of time, but I, I've shared in this committee before the long list of statements from leading Democrats in Congress and the leading Democrats on this very committee who specifically and aggressively called for the defunding of the, of the police. And as a result, in 2020, in New York City, officials cut $1 billion from the police department's 2021 budget. These are the completely foreseeable and obvious effects of these soft-on-crime policies that are advanced by Soros-funded DAs. Alvin Bragg is, in my view, probably the worst offender. And they're trying to manipulate the facts. They're trying to change it. But I thank you all for being here. I yield the remainder of my time. It will be in order. If the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff, is recognized for five minutes. Almost three weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, is the microphone on? Sure. Yeah, just pull it close. Okay. Almost three weeks ago, Donald J. Trump was indicted by a grand jury in Manhattan on dozens of counts of fraud in connection with a hush money payment scheme in which his personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, previously went to jail. Since the former president's indictment, the Manhattan District Attorney has been the subject of countless death threats and racist diatribes. Others have made ugly appeals to anti-Semitism in an effort to attack the proceedings. And this committee, this committee has used every means at its disposal to disrupt, interrupt, and interfere with the prosecution, demanding documents it has no right to obtain and no jurisdiction to demand, subpoenaing a former district attorney, deputy district attorney, and threatening to subpoena the DA, DA himself, and now holding this hearing in Manhattan in a vain attempt to intimidate or embarrass the prosecutorial authority. Now, the majority denies that this is the purpose of today's hearing. They would have you believe it is a mere coincidence that all of a sudden and out of the blue, the chairman decided that the state of New York is a wonderful place to do a hearing. Not the chairman's home state of Ohio with its high rates of murder, but New York State. And of all the cities in New York, they would pick New York City. And of all the boroughs in New York, they pick Manhattan. Apparently, Manhattan is just lovely this time of year. What a remarkable coincidence we are meant to believe of all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world, we just happened to walk into this one. How absurd. Of course, this is not a coincidence at all. Instead, it is the GOP leadership in Congress doing what it has done best for the last six years, and that is to act as the criminal defense counsel for Donald J. Trump. Well, let me tell you this, let me tell you this. Capitol Police, gentlemen, will suspend. Capitol Police, Cap Capitol Police will remove let, the gentleman let, from the audience. Let me tell you this, gentlemen, let me tell you this. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Donald J. Trump. Gentlemen, will suspend. Till we got order. Gentlemen, will suspend. The audience has to be that has to be in order. Capitol, Capitol Police, Capitol Police, sir. Can we have order? Yeah, we are working on it, Mr. Mr. Schiff, gentlemen. Capitol Police, please, please remove the gentleman from the audience. No, you got to go. You got to go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've given you several warnings. You got to go, unfortunately.
was a very unfortunate attempt, attack on Ralph Nader. <laughs> committee will be in order. Committee will be in order. The gentleman uh, from California. His comments about Ralph Nader are way out of line. Um, <laughs> of course, it is not a coincidence that we are here in Manhattan. Instead, it is the GOP leadership in Congress doing what it has done best over the last six years, and that is to act as the criminal defense counsel for Donald J. Trump. Well, let me tell you this. Donald Trump doesn't need the lawyers on this committee to be his criminal defense lawyer. He has plenty of those already. Nor is that the role of Congress. Quite the opposite. Our role should be to defend the rule of law, not tear it down. We should be defending the principle that no one is above the law, not attempting to establish a new principle that if you are politically powerful enough, you get a pass. We should be defending the independence of the grand jury and the safety of a public servant enforcing the law, not adding to the dangers to both. The Manhattan District Attorney has the burden of proving Donald Trump guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A jury of ordinary citizens will have the responsibility of determining whether he has met that burden. That this process will be the same for a former president as it would be for his lawyer or his driver or his doorman or his neighbor is the strength of a democracy, not its weakness. The first thing Chairman Jordan said today was that this hearing is about the administration of justice, but more accurately, it is about an effort to interfere with the administration of justice. He said that here in Manhattan, the scales of justice are being weighed down by politics, and they are, but only today. And by this committee's actions in trying to intimidate the Manhattan DA for having the audacity to believe that in America, being rich, being powerful, even being president of the United States does not entitle you to violate the law with impunity. There was a time in America when both parties used to believe in the rule of law. But sadly, those days are over. One of America's two great political parties believes that political might makes right. And more than right, it means that you are beyond the reach of the law and beyond accountability. The more power, the less justice. But this is not democracy. This is the antithesis of democracy. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of our witnesses being here today. Thank you for sharing your compelling stories. Um, I, I would just say, Mr. Morgan, after hearing what you've heard today, I think you probably understand why it's real tough to sit down and have a logical, cogent argument on how we might jointly, with nonpartisan affiliation, try to solve some of these problems. What do you think? And, and talks about you guys, Republicans, about Trump. Hey, he was in, while Trump was in office, he's busy holding hearings trying to get him out for four years. So I don't, I don't think you have the right to say that you, you politicized when you were in power you tried to get Trump out, you couldn't get him out. Let's face reality, you tried. The dossier was a fake, everything what it was. You All tried right. to get him, he's sitting there laughing, that's, that's very nice. And the other Democrats are telling us that we're all props for sitting here. <coughs> Please don't talk down to us. It's thank, really not nice. Th thanks, Guess, Mr. Borg. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I wanted to, to just, uh, just uh, read some comments. These are not these are not by a Republican. These aren't from Republican members of this committee. These are these are just comments here. Um, this is this is what uh, an individual said. Said, I would add that you know it's not so much from necessarily federal funding, but it's something that I do want to spend more time on and focus on, and use the the plight. I mean, use the pulpit representing the district in public safety. I think a lot of people walk around the city very scared right now. And the violent crime wave is very concerning. This individual also said, I think people are scared to go on the subway in the whole district. I've heard it from all over the place, from the wealthy, the wealthy areas in Tribeca, to Chinatown, to Borough Park, to Sunset Park. I think a lot of people are afraid. He also said, I'm very concerned about the safety in the city. He also said, I've been part of this community defending the victims and trying to protect the public for my whole career. And I think that those experiences resonate with people in different ways for different reasons, close quote. We cannot allow people to just continue to cycle through the system because it's demoralizing to the cops and it gives everyone a perception of danger. 
He also said whether or not the data says that it's safe or not. There is a perception in the city that it is not safe, and one of the reasons for that is the perpetual recidivism that is going on, close quote. He also said, quote, you've got people randomly being shot on the subways. You've got people randomly being thrown into car trucks and driven to remote places and shot. There's an insecurity not felt in 25 years. It's scary to me and far away the number one issue, close quote. That didn't come from anybody on this side of the aisle. It didn't even come from any of you at the table. It came from Mr. Goldman over there. We sit in his district. He knows that there's a crime problem. And we've been hearing about a study. Um, let, me, let me refer you to the heritage study that my colleague referred to, and I ask that it's mission in the Objection. Direction. Thank you. Quote, when you remove the crime-infested, homicide-riddled cities from the state murder rate featured in the Third Way study, which was co-authored by Mr. Kessler, you dramatically lower the murder rate for that state, upending their conclusions, his conclusions, and exposing the piece for what it really is, a straightforward attempt at political projection dressed up as a study. That's what you've been hearing about to rebut the stories and the facts of the lives of the victims and the witnesses and those who live in this city today. Mr. Holden. Why won't your family go take the subway, the, the mass transit system in this, in this uh, city? What, what they've experienced when my daughter took the subway the other day for the first time, she says, I'm not going back because I felt unsafe. I, I just, people talking to themselves, people screaming. Uh, it is terrible. And by the way, if you want to cherry pick uh, numbers uh, from the other side, and I'm a Democrat, but I'm – against what I've heard about uh, these stats. Two, uh, downloaded from the NYPD this morning, 25% increase in all the seven major crimes in New York City in, the, in a two-year period. 26% in the 13-year period for Manhattan North, Manhattan South, 59% increase in a two-year period in the seven major crimes, 17% uh, in the 13-year period. For all of New York City, and this, again, is from NYPD, so cherry-pick your own numbers, but this is overall. 45% increase in the two-year period in crime, in the seven major crimes, and a 23% in the 13-year. So this is what we're facing, and this is why we go to work. And we fought so hard in the 90s to stop this crime wave that we had in New York City, and we did it. But now it's being rolled back to the bad old days. Yield back. I think the gentleman, gentleman yields back. Let me just, before going to Mr. Cicilline, um, we've been at it this two hours. Are the witnesses fine? If any, can you, because we'll keep going. If, but if you need a break, just please let us know. The gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield 30 seconds to Mr. Goldman from New York. I appreciate Mr. Biggs' reference to some of the concerns that uh, we have about public safety because it is something that is shared across the aisle. The problem is that you are using this as a political stunt unrelated to real concerns about public safety around this country. Manhattan has the sixth fewest murders out of the top 50 cities in this country. So we all know why you're here. So don't play the political games. You want to have a meaningful conversation? Let's talk. I yield back. Uh, I want to thank uh, the witnesses for being here today and, of course, sharing uh, some very painful stories about your loss. Uh, I want to start by emphasizing that keeping Americans safe is one of the most, if not the most important responsibilities that we have in government. Uh, it's one of our most important callings as lawmakers. And I was mayor of a city and presided over the lowest crime rate in 30 years, serving as a public safety commissioner. So I understand this very deeply. Uh, but my colleagues, sadly, are not here to meaningfully work on public safety solutions. This hearing was called for a purpose, to intimidate a district attorney for doing his job and upholding the rule of law. And you know how I know this? Because our colleagues consistently vote against laws that would increase public safety and ignore facts on what actually decreases crime. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death of children in America. And it kills 40,000 Americans a year. I mean, it would be in order. And yet my colleagues... The gentleman suspend just for a second. I'd ask that the clock stop, yes, please. Yes, clock stop. We'd we'll be happy to do that. We need to stop the conversations over here. Uh, the, the gentleman... We, gentleman...
gentleman deserves to be heard. The, the committee uh, guests will please refrain from talking and chatting so that Mr. Cicilline can make his presentation and ask his questions. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death of children in America and kills 40,000 Americans a year. Yet my colleagues vote repeatedly against even the most common sense gun violence prevention measures. They vote against getting assault weapons off the streets, despite the previous assault weapons ban that drastically reduced gun violence. They vote against alerting people to active shooters. They vote against safe storage and red flag laws. They vote against community-based crime prevention programs. They vote against background checks. And the list goes on and on. And more than that, they brought us here today to attack a district attorney who has actually seen a decrease in violent crime during his tenure, all because he dared to hold Donald Trump accountable. So please spare me this suggestion that this is about a sincere interest in finding solutions to crime. This is about your agenda to earn the admiration and support and good wishes of the former President of the United States. But I, for one, would actually like to hear about some actual solutions to public safety, and particularly to gun violence in our communities. And that brings me to my first question. Ms. Fisher, how uh, do our gun laws, or lack thereof, contribute to America's gun violence epidemic? And is the rate of gun violence in this country and the rate of gun death comparable in any other developed country in the world. Thank you, Representative. Uh, the gun violence rate in the United States is 26 times higher than every other high-income country. So we are comparatively a much more dangerous place to live. And though violent crime, and I strongly uh, push forward that gun violence is violent crime and should be considered as a part of this hearing, Violent crime is going down in New York City according to law enforcement's own data. However, we could be doing so much more to ensure that New Yorkers are protected and all Americans are protected by enacting comprehensive universal backgrounds checks, by having a licensing system and requiring a permit to purchase. We could also be banning the assault weapons, assault weapons that are most commonly used in mass shootings that are killing our children every day. And one of the things that I think the Congress has a responsibility to look at, although we don't have jurisdiction over state criminal prosecutions, obviously, or local prosecutions, what uh, is the evidence with respect to the focus on exclusively arrest and incarceration, but how do we prevent crimes? What are the good strategies? Because frankly, by the time someone's a victim of a crime, we've already failed. Our goal should be to prevent crime. So what does the evidence say with respect to those two different strategies? We need to be investing in prevention, largely because there's so many guns that are being trafficked from out of state. We need to be investing in our communities, and that's with resources towards community violence intervention strategies and prevention programs, including in schools, more trauma support for victims, more resources, better housing, all of those issues in terms of the inequities that are impacting especially impoverished black and brown communities in this country and in this city need to be addressed as a public health crisis, and we need to be investing in prevention. Thank you. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Gentleman, Ms. Tiffany is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, um, would you rather have sympathy for the police, or would you rather have respect from elected leaders? Well, respect and sympathy. Uh, it's a very difficult time, time in uh, my 40 years now this is probably the most difficult time in policing that I've ever seen. But, uh, yeah, you know, respect is important, of course. Do soft on crime policies lead to less gun violence? I believe so, yes. So you believe going soft on crime is going to cause there to be less gun violence in your city? No, not less. Soft on crime is going to cause more gun violence. Today. Okay, I'll state it this way then. Does, do soft on crime policies lead to more gun violence? Yes. Ms. Harrison and Ms. Barain. The ranking member said this city is safer. 
Is this city safer in your mind, Ms. Harrison? No, I have a lot of friends through my advocacy that live here that are considering moving <coughs> their entire families. Ms. Brain, is this city safer under District Attorney Bragg? Absolutely not. There's all kinds of criminal elements roaming the street, free to do whatever they want. Mr. Holden, the District Attorney's Office conceded they used $5,000 in federal funds, which are authorized by us here, <laughs> Um, for purposes other than fighting violent crime here in Manhattan. Do you agree with the district attorney's decision to do that? No, I don't. And uh, I, I disagree with most of what uh, D.A. Braggs uh, is about, uh, especially the soft on crime. But what, what ha what's happened in New York City, the reason why our crime, and it's not going down, it's going up if you look at the, the trends, um, we have the lowest incarceration rate of any major city in the United States. I'll, I'll repeat that. The lowest incarceration rate of, let's say, 40 of the biggest cities, New York, New York City has the lowest. And that's because Mayor de Blasio, uh, before Mayor Adams, started releasing everyone from jail. So, of course, crime was going to go up, and it skyrocketed in 2020. So what, that's the reason we still... I believe we have to arrest more people, and this, uh, D.A. Bragg will disagree, and, and they should go to jail when they commit a crime. So, Mr. Holden, in regards to the – so there's this federal funding that comes in, and it's not being used for, to fight violent crime. Is it – you know, as an elected representative, do you view it as inappropriate that those of us that are responsible for those dollars going to fighting crime – using federal funds, is it inappropriate for us to review how those dollars are being spent? Yes, it is certainly. We should review it, yes. Mr. Holden, have you been asked to be on any of the major networks to deliver your message? Have you been asked, for example, to be on CNN to deliver your message? Uh, I, I've been asked not from CNN, but I have been asked uh, on other major networks, yes. And you've shared those comments. Ms. Bray, Ms. Yes. Harrison, have you been asked to be on one of the major networks to tell your story? Not CNN. Ms. Harrison. No, not CNN, not MSNBC. They refuse to even acknowledge that victims are a part of this hearing. So let's, let's talk about, we hear percentages. Time after time we're hearing percentages. In 2022, as a result of a 7% increase in rapes, that's 110 more people that I got raped here in New York City. Those are almost all women, I'm sure. 110 people. Auto theft. 3,256 more carjackings here in New York as a result of this soft on crime. Transit crimes, people being pushed off from subways, right? 521 more people. 521 more people. 30% more? That's 521 more people. That's what we're seeing, ladies and gentlemen. These are real people that are being harmed. I just want to conclude with this, Mr. Chairman. I'm so glad we're having this first hearing in New York, but I want you to come to my state. I want you to come to Milwaukee, where we had a district attorney. Here's his quote when he started out. Is there going to be an individual I divert or put into a treatment program who's going to go out and kill somebody? <coughs> you bet. Milwaukee has 10% of the population, and they have 25% of the crime. Mr. Kessler, that's the problem, is the Soros prosecutors are not doing their job. And in Wisconsin, now we've got a Soros Supreme Court justice. The people of Wisconsin better hang on because violent crime is going to get worse. Come to Milwaukee, Mr. Chairman, for the next hearing. Gentlemen's time's expired. Ms. Scanlon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our constituents elect us to make their lives better. They send us to Washington to work on the issues that impact American families, whether it's health care, jobs, the cost of prescription drugs, infrastructure, clean air and water, climate rescue, and, of course, safe communities and schools. But every day in Congress, we are seeing the right-wing extremists who control the House failing all of us choosing publicity over progress, choosing politics over people, and choosing protecting the disgraced and now indicted former president rather than protecting our democracy.
Today, at the urging of the former president and his lawyers, the chairman has dragged the entire House Judiciary Committee to New York, inserting the federal government into a purely state and local matter with no credible pretense of jurisdiction. And he's making the American taxpayer, and especially the New Yorkers, who he claims to be so concerned about, making those taxpayers pay for this foolishness. This isn't governance. It's not working for the American people. It's grandstanding. It's a stunt. Just look at all the cameras here. And every second of it is preventing us from being able to do the real work that the people who elected us expect us to do in Congress. To our witnesses here today who've shared their pain and trauma in being victims of crime and violence, I am so sorry for the impact that has had on you and your families. Anyone listening to you has to be moved by what you've experienced. And I applaud your courage in trying to take that pain and move to change things going forward. But I fear that you have been re-victimized by this hearing because this hearing is not going to provide that change. It's not a serious effort to make our communities safer. Our Republican colleagues aren't in New York City to prevent crime. They're here to protect someone who's been charged with committing crimes. And how do we know that? Look at the time, place, and manner of this hearing. We know that the timing isn't a coincidence because as soon as it became obvious that the Manhattan District Attorney was getting ready to charge Mr. Trump with crimes, Mr. Trump's lawyers sent a letter to the chairman telling him to use the full powers of Congress to go after the Manhattan DA. We know that the place is important because the choice of place for this hearing isn't a coincidence. It's about protecting Mr. Trump because it's being held in the city where Mr. Trump was indicted and arrested just two weeks ago. If this hearing were focused on fighting crime, as several people have mentioned, there are other jurisdictions that have much higher rates of crime. And, if this, and as to the manner of this hearing, we know that it's about protecting Mr. Trump because it's being led by the disgraced former president's closest allies, the ones who benefit the most if he can beat the criminal charges here in New York or if they can intimidate the Manhattan DA or the other prosecutors across the country who are investigating other alleged crimes. Crime prevention is a serious topic and it deserves serious discussion. But that's not what this hearing is about. Instead, we're seeing a circus, a performance by partisan politicians who've hitched their wagons to the Trump train. So I and my colleagues refuse to sit idly by while families across this country, from Alabama to Louisville to Nashville to Uvalde to Buffalo to Boulder, while they're mourning the loss of their loved ones in violence, we stand ready to pass legislation to address the serious issues facing all Americans if our Republican colleagues will let us. Now, Ms. Fisher, you and several others have mentioned the iron pipeline, the route through which many of the crime guns in states like New York and Pennsylvania are acquired. Just last year, the ATF intercepted 400 illegal guns from southern states that were being sent to my community in Philadelphia. Can you speak to the impact of lax gun laws in states that um, lack more um, specific gun laws, the impact that it has on gun violence is in cities like New York and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia? Absolutely. Thank you, Representative. Um, because uh, traffickers are able to easily and illegally obtain guns um, in states with weak gun laws like Florida or Georgia or the Carolinas, um, they are able to easily purchase lots of guns and traffic them into neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by structural and systemic inequities for decades. Um, and we're talking about um, vulnerable communities that are already lacking in access to resources. 
Um, and because of that, those guns are being used um, in crimes and also because gun carrying is more likely when people feel afraid and, general, general um, ladies, and, and they ladies. are feeling more powerful. General ladies, time has expired. Mr. General Chairman, ladies. I would just seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a report entitled Uncovering the Truth About Pennsylvania Crime Guns. Without objection. Thank you. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Mr. Good Chairman, I'm sorry. They keep addressing us, the victims who are here to testify and make change. We're here to effectuate change and then not allowing us to comment at all. Just for a second, Ms. Harrison. Mr. I'm sure Mr. Gooden will give you a chance to respond. The time belongs now to Mr. Gooden. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Brame, I heard you saying how disrespectful this was. I share your concerns. But we're going to come back to you, but I'd first like to yield to the chairman. Oh, that's fine. Go, I'll, I'll yield. Go to Ms. Harrison. You, you know, Ms. Brame, I I, I'm, I'm disgusted with what I'm seeing. This is, this is a serious event. We've called you all in here to share your experience. Um, we've been called jackbooted thugs uh, by the opposing party for having this hearing. Uh, it's been called foolishness. I don't believe your stories are foolish. Um, we've heard from the congressman that represents this district just six months ago who said, quote, you've got people randomly being shot on the subways. You've got people randomly being thrown into car trunks and driven to remote places and shot. There's an insecurity not felt here in 25 years, end quote. If the local congressman is saying that, then I don't believe you all are crazy for saying the same things. Mm -hmm. And I thank you all for being here. Uh, Ms. Brame, you've shared so much, and we, we thank you. Um, is there any, any further comments you'd like to have? Uh, we hear all the talk about the former president from mm -hmm. the other side. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not a political hearing, uh, despite claims from the other side. And I give you the floor. The only people I hear talking about politics or President Trump is from the other side. I don't hear no one. I don't hear any of these victims. I don't hear anyone else talking about President Trump except from the people from the other side, from the other side of where? The other side of the moon, the other side of the world, the other side. Whatever that is. Let me tell you something. Victims can care less about anyone's political ideology or party. Neither do criminals. They don't go up to a person and ask them if they're a Democrat or a Republican before they bust them in the head. Okay? Or before they push them in front of a train. Or before they, they stab them to death. These are real life people that we're dealing with. We pay you guys. Our tax dollars pay you. You work for us. We do not work for you. Committee will be in order. Committee will be in order. Oh, belongs to the gentleman from Texas. Ms. Brame, I, I want to thank you again. And while the other side wants you to stop talking, I hope you'll continue mm -hmm. uh, well after Absolutely. today. And thank, Absolutely. Thank you. I'll uh, yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Well, I was just going to say, Ms. Harrison, are you grandstanding? No, and it, it seems like, you know, as Madeline mentioned, the, the other side is here on taxpayer dollars. The least that they could do is listen to our side of it, ask us questions. They've brought witnesses in to counter our <laughs> hor horrific stories for their agenda. All they want to do is talk about gun legislation. Well, you can have all the gun legislation on the books, but if it's not enforced, which is what Alvin Bragg is doing, then it's not going to matter and people are going to die. And that's why we're here. And I appreciate your oversight because we do need help. And if they continue to ignore it, people are going to continue to die. Is this committee victimizing you, Ms. Brame, as Democrat said? Absolutely not. This committee is, has given me a platform, has given me a seat at the table to be able to tell my story and raise awareness for victims all over not just New York City, but all over this country, especially from Philadelphia. Ms. Fisher, if, if, if the guns are the problem, why didn't the Democrats fix it? The Democrats have worked hard to pass well, they had control. They controlled all the House, all the Senate. The guy, they still have the White House. Why didn't they fix it last Congress? We if need the answer comprehensive is, if, gun violence prevention legislation to be passed, and this Congress has the ability and the capacity to do that. I was in the Congress last uh, last session. Mr. So Nader was the chair. They now. tried. They, they could have passed. They didn't pass we it. We need Congress to go back to would Washington and pass strong Mr. gun violence prevention yield? legislation. No, I'm going to go to Mr. DiGiacomo. Mr. DiGiacomo, uh, are, are, are you grandstanding? Not at all. Uh, you know, honestly, 
I'm You're here, here representing the detectives of this great town, right? I'm absolutely, and very proud of it. I, I am not here other than to ask for help. Someone just said that we can't do anything here. Well, if the people of the United States Congress can't do anything to help us, we're in a lot of trouble because there are some powerful people around this table that could help and stop the violence and make the streets safer for the people of New York City and the police officers and, and detectives that serve them. Thank you. Uh, we're here for help. Thank we you. We need help. I thank the gentleman from uh, Texas, and uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Can the gentlelady yield for a moment? Yes, Mr. Nadler. Thank you. I just want to answer uh, Mr. Jordan's question. Last year, when we were in control, the Democrats in the House passed very comprehensive gun control legislation. The Democrats in the Senate voted for very comprehensive gun control legislation. But because of the filibuster, you needed 60 votes, and we got no Republican votes, and that's why it didn't pass. I, I, I thank the gentlelady. I yield back. I echo the, the, the uh, statistics that were just offered by the ranking member, Mr. Nadler. Democrats have been working to reduce crime, to reduce gun violence, crime, uh, wherever we can. And let me say, everyone, I believe everyone in this room has sympathy for the horrific stories, the horrific losses of life, the horrific attacks, the anti-Semitic attacks on attack on your son. We have great sympathy. Uh, we hear you. You are properly raising your voices. Don't let anything that we have to say indicate that we don't think you should be lifting your voices. But there is an underlying sham going on here. I know you don't like to hear it. Your voices are important, but two things can be true at the same time. We are not properly here. It is not our jurisdiction to oversee or to interfere with an independent district attorney's office. We are not properly here. This is not our jurisdiction. I wish One of us are that, asking you to excuse interfere. Me. Gentle lady controls the time. It is proper that you raise your voices, but it is hypocritical that we are here. If this committee wants to do something about violence in this country, about the horrific losses of life, do something. Work on legislation with us. This weekend, two more mass shootings. Is that calling your attention? Are you up in arms to say what in God's name can we do to reduce the slaughter of our children, your children, our children? It's the third Monday of April, and so far this year, more than 5,000 people have been killed by gun violence. Another 9,200 caught in the crossfire. Nearly 500 children and teenagers have died because of rampant gun violence. We know that number of families devastated and lives forever altered is even larger. And we're only in the fourth month. None of this is new. Hearing after hearing, one Congress to the next, the numbers keep repeating themselves. More than 200 people a day shot. 40,000 people a year killed by guns. We know all this. Facts are supposed to influence action. Horrifying facts are supposed to elicit a response. Yet my Republican colleagues prefer gesturing about violent crime rather than doing something about it. I'm reminded of uh, the character in succession, the late Logan Roy, said, you are not serious people. If you are serious about doing something about violence, gun violence, and other violence, please join us. Last Congress, as the uh, ranking member said, the House passed a universal background checks bill. 63% of Republican gun owners support it, yet only eight of my Republican colleagues supported the bill. 202 of them voted against it, including every Republican member in this room. Again, not serious people. Assault weapons are the firearm of choice in mass shootings. The Democratic House last Congress voted to ban these weapons of war. Only two Republicans out of 211 voted for it. Neither is in this room today. When Senate Republicans were finally motivated to, act to action by the horrific slaughter of babies in Uvalde, did my Republican colleagues here join? No, not a single one of them voted for the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Make no mistake, 
If the concern about addressing violent crime uh, addressed by my Republican colleagues was genuine, they would have acted. There'd be more for us to be talking with you about here. We're only here today because Chairman Jordan and his colleagues want to make a show of defending a former failed, twice impeached, crooked president. This is not serious. Violent crime is a grave national issue. It demands serious consideration by legislators who want to make a difference and to save lives. That is reserved for us. I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Gooden. Gooden. Can I ask you, why, not, why is anybody blaming the shooter? You're always blaming guns. No one blames the shooter. They're crazy people. The committee, the committee will be in order. No Mr. Borgen, the committee will be in order. The, the gentlelady had, I believe, like 18 seconds. And you were yielding to was it Mr. Goldman? Yes. The gentleman's recognized. I, I want to be very clear to all of you, as reflected in my statements, that we are all very, very concerned about your stories. We are concerned about every victim. I was a prosecutor for 10 years. Victims' rights are essential. But what we're talking about here is something that the state needs to deal with. The reason why we're saying this is a political theater is that we don't have jurisdiction to do anything about what you're General concerned ladies, about. General so ladies. I just want you to understand that. General ladies, time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Benz. Pull that real close, Cliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you, witnesses, for being here and sharing with us your incredibly challenging stories. Uh, quote, the justice system's not cooperating this is a quote from the, uh, one of the retailers here in your town. The justice system is just not cooperating. It's getting to a point where you either have to padlock every item that has to be stolen or could be stolen, or you have to fight back. And if you fight back, you take the risk of going to jail for protecting your property. That's one of the reasons mm -hmm. we're here. Here's, here's several more because I've heard a lot of suggestions that we're here for reasons having nothing to do with why, why I'm here. This has 8.5 million people. That's just twice what my state has. It has 58 million people within 250 miles. It is 4 million larger than our next largest city, which would be L. It has a GDP of $1.56 trillion. This is an asset we should be doing everything to protect, and particularly the people within it. Mr. Holden, drawing your attention to the next to last paragraph in your testimony, it appears that you believe that we in Congress can actually do something. You actually talk about what we might do. Yeah, and, and so I would like you just to elaborate just a bit so that people aren't thinking that we're just here for show. We can actually do something. Can you go to that next to last paragraph and share your thoughts? Yes. When um, the public is not being protected, when we fear for our safety day in and day out, we, have, we lose our freedom. And if Congress can't do something, then I don't think anyone can. We, you can. You can do this with funding. You can do this with... Um, certainly federal attorneys jumping in, prosecutors. There's a lot of things I think Congress can do. I'm here because, and as a Democrat, I don't agree with a lot of my party's stances on things, but, uh, and I'm more of an independent person. But I've, in, I've been on six years in the city council, and they've never held a hearing on victims' rights. Mm. They hold... They hold hearings on criminal rights and how they're not being treated properly. And I get that. That's important to have. But what about victims' rights? I, six years on the city council, on the public safety committee, not one hearing. Mr. Holland, I'm interrupt if I may. I want, I'm going to stick with you, though, because you also say in your letter, and this is a response to Ranking Member Nadler's questions about percentages and crime reduction, but you note in your testimony about cherry-picking of statistics. So I want you to talk about that for just a second. You note that, uh, that it's easy to twist these numbers around. And I'm kind of reminded about something that was said a little earlier, that it's easy to focus on percentages, but we should be focusing on the real numbers, as Mr. Tiffany pointed out, the thousands when we talk about percentages as, as though it's meaningless. Tell me what you, what you say yeah, in your that's life. A, that's a real thing because I have businesses, and I have one individual who owns four gas stations in my district, and he's from Southeast Asia. He's an immigrant. He uh, is living the American dream until recently, until 2019 when the bail reform package went through the state. Uh, he says, a good day for me and my four gas stations when, I, uh, when I'm not held up. We consider it a good day. He's losing two or $3,000 a day in the four gas stations with petty theft and being held up. It's a serious issue. And I, we fought to get 
crime. We had 17 straight years in New York City of crime reduction up until 2019 when they pushed the bail reform and discovery through the state. And now crime is going up. And again, 13 years we've had an increase in crime. So anybody cherry picking those numbers, anybody who's a real New Yorker knows that we had low crime and we were proud of that. We were the safest city in the United States, not anymore. Thank you. The, the, uh, uh, the, we're, we're just a few seconds left. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm happy we're here in New York. But for those of you who want to see the consequences of lax uh, prosecution practices, come to Portland, Oregon. Mm. And, and look at what's happened to that beautiful city where I went to law school years ago. And you can wander around in downtown Portland without fear of, of anything happening. The restaurants were great. The cultural scene was great. In the last three years, that has changed so dramatically. It is ridiculous. And if you, if you want to see what happens when you don't prosecute people for throwing bricks through windows, starting fires in downtown, running everybody else out, come to Portland. It's, a, it's a so incredibly sad. And, but I'm going to come back to New York for a moment. My last little phrase here is, despite what you folks are enduring here as a result of runaway progressivism, uh, you still uh, have these wonderful people, the police working for you, and I'm happy for that. But I tell you, as I sit here and listen to Democrat politicians use rampant crime and violence to justify more restrictions on possession of firearms, I must say, please, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's turn our attention to the good things we can do in Congress. And, and with that, I, uh, I thank you all and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, just a brief response to that. I mean, uh, yes, we're thinking about gun control and trying to reduce gun violence because of Nashville and Louisville and uh, Alabama yesterday. So um, it seems to me that it's unsustainable. We need to do something to address it. Um, I, you know, I believe the Second Amendment is important, but I think protecting second graders from being killed is important as well. Uh, Ms. Harris and Ms. Brame, Mr. Borgen, I, I want to commend you. Uh, I was a prosecutor for 12 years, uh, four as a federal prosecutor, eight as a local prosecutor uh, in Maryland, which is kind of the birthplace of, of the victims' rights movement. And so I understand that um, the, what you're doing and the role that you play, uh, in, in fact, it really transformed the criminal justice system in the 90s and, and the 2000s, and I, I encourage you to continue on. I, you don't need that. I can tell just by what I've heard from you today, you're going to sustain it and keep fighting on behalf of your um, your loved ones, but I, I commend you for what you've done. I, I did want to say this uh, with respect to whether this is serious or not, and, you know, I'm not going to look in people's hearts and try and judge uh, the motives for whether these hearings are, you know, serious or not or, you know, what's behind them, but I'll say this. We've got Republican colleagues who've introduced legislation to uh, eliminate the ATF, um, eliminate the FBI, um, Mr. Trump called for defunding the Department of Justice and the FBI. As a former federal prosecutor, I, I can tell you that if you get rid of those three agencies, there's no federal mechanism or arm to actually prosecute uh, violent crime at the federal level. That means terrorism. That means gangs. Uh, that means multi-state issues. The big takedown of um, the Sinaloa cartel on Friday I think was the reason we were able to do that was because we had a strong federal government that was able to cross federal lines and international lines and, and complete those prosecutions. So I certainly oppose the defund the federal law enforcement arms that we've, we've had discussions about. And with respect to the funding in general, I think even at the local level, the federal government can and has been helpful and should be more helpful, too, from a funding standpoint. I, I think there's, it's right we can't really meddle in local prosecutions per se, but uh, funding for victims' rights, for resources, for training, for hiring and retention police officers, because I know police departments are competing now for a shortage of officers. So I think it's important for us to try and step in in that way. But I would encourage uh, my colleagues on the other side to speak about the specific types of proposals they would put forward uh, at the federal level to address the local crime issues that you're talking about here today, because I haven't heard any so far. With that, I'll yield the, the, the remainder of my time to Mr. Goldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ivey. Mr. Borgen, I understand uh, that your son was the victim of an anti-Semitic attack 
uh, and I'm terribly sorry to hear this, uh, anti-Semitism hits all of us, uh, regardless of party. And now, now that we have recently learned that uh, George Santos, who not only remains in Congress but is announcing his re-election campaign today, uh, is not actually Jewish, uh, the ranking member and I are the only Jewish members from the entire state of New York. And we are deeply concerned about anti-Semitism in New York, which has increased more than 400 percent in the past eight years. Now, today we've already heard two members of the majority reference what one called the Sorosization of criminal justice, the criminal justice system, which is, of course, a reference to George Soros, a Holocaust survivor who lived the American dream. Many more have said the same. My constituents are very concerned that these smears related to Mr. Soros-supported uh, prosecutors are anti-Semitic. Do you believe they're anti-Semitic? Well, here's my answer to that. I don't know if Soros is Jewish. He can't be anti-Semitic. I, I can't believe that, especially – No, what people say when they use Soros. Soros' Soros politics, he's just a liberal – lefty politician. I don't think it has nothing to do with what his beliefs so are. He, want, he, he wants to create whatever he wants to create. It's his business. All right. I, in, I appreciate I, that. I, I, I think you're, wanted, but Mark, I, I don't have a lot of time, and I'm no, sorry. I think Mark Levine, who just got elected from Lower Manhattan, got a, a, a petition signed with 29 signatures protesting this conference. I don't know if you're right. aware of it. Can I, can I just reclaim my time? Because I only have sorry. 20 seconds. Yeah. And I want to mention that when I was walking in here today, there was a man outside with a sign. And I would just like to hold this sign up. You saw it, right? Yeah. There's a Star of David with two dollar signs and Soros. Would you say that's anti-Semitic? That's 100 percent anti-Semitic, and it's disgusting. Right. It's disgusting. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to echo the comments from Mr. Holden. Uh, your allegiance is to your constituents. Each one of us is here because of our constituents, our allegiances to our constituents as well. My constituents live in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Uh, feels about as far away from New York City sometimes as you can get. Uh, the floor that I was on in my hotel last night was taller than any building in my entire home county, uh, Botetourt County. But uh, our hearts are with the people of New York City. Our hearts are with the victims of these crimes that are being committed against the people of New York City. And every crime has a victim, and every – and it's not just about – numbers. It's about real people, as Mr. Tiffany was saying. And we are hearing some of those stories, and I want to thank you all for being brave to come here and share your stories with us. Uh, we're grateful to you. But my constituents are scared because they're watching what's happening in New York City, and they know that uh, the Shenandoah Valley, if they adopt the wrong policies, if they elect the wrong prosecutors, their lives could uh, turn for the worse, and their cities and counties could be uh, full of crime as well. And the policies that have been adopted in New York City are policies that were just uh, adopted in Virginia uh, when Democrats took over the House and Senate and the governor's mansion between, two th between 2019 and 2021. Um, they abolished parole – or they reversed policies that were put in place in 1995 that abolished parole, instituted mandatory minimum sentences, and presumptions against bail. Those are all gone now. And we're worried, quite frankly, in Virginia uh, because we see uh, the impact of those policies here in New York along with uh, the falling apart of what I consider to be a three-legged stool when it comes to uh, the fight against crime. You need three legs of a stool. You need uh, police who are going to arrest. You need prosecutors who are going to prosecute. And you need judges who are going to put people in jail. And uh, here in New York, uh, you don't have those three legs. I'll let you decide how many legs you have and how strong those are. But when you get rid of the policies that, uh, like a presumption against bail that we got rid of in Virginia, uh, like the bail policies that you have here, the ending of cash bail uh, here in New York City, it's like termites eating away at that stool. So no matter how strong you have in, in terms of your, your mayor, who's a former police chief, or your police chief now, uh, if, if you lose those legs or if you have – uh, the stool being eaten away, uh, you see the spike in crime that's happened. And we have a spike in crime here in New York City. Uh, 1,500 rapes up 7 percent, robberies up 26 percent, felony assaults up 13 percent, burglaries up 23 percent, grand larcenies up 26 percent, auto thefts up 32 percent. 
all accounting for a 23% increase in major crimes in just the last year. So we do have a, uh, you have a problem in New York, one that uh, we're, we're afraid could spread to other places like uh, my area of Virginia. You know, we talked about the use of taxpayer dollars, and Ms. Brame, you uh, talked about the lack of services that you received. And so we inquired about uh, how many taxpayer dollars uh, go to New York City and to Alvin Bragg's office. Uh, the DA's office receives $204,730 in federal grant money during the current award period uh, from the Department of Justice's Justice Assistance Grant Program, which is subgranted to the City of New York, goes toward addressing violent and other felony crimes in our jurisdiction. Uh, more interestingly, and more to your point, the DA's office received $583,111 in federal grant money yearly uh, this past year from the Victims of Crime Victim and Witness Assistant Grant Program, which is subgranted through the New York State Office of Victim Services. Uh, use of these funds is to be used to provide information to victims and their families related to the prosecution of cases and assisting victims with understanding the criminal justice system. Uh, over half a million dollars sitting in Alvin Bragg's office to help people like you. Do you feel like you got help from Alvin Bragg as the case was going forward? No, I, I received no help from his office. I was, me and my family, we were treated like garbage. You know, I, I can't describe it any more than, you know, what I have already. You know, it, it was the most horrific experience that I've ever experienced. It, it was just bad. Were you, you alerted nothing. when the plea deals were cut for two of those uh, mm -hmm. offenders? Were you alerted to those plea deals when they were cut? No. Were you allowed to put uh, a victim's... Uh, statement into not the not record. for Mary Saunders not upon her sentencing for Travis Stewart I did um, and for the the other two but um, they, they dismissed those gang assault and those murder indictments um, behind my back that's abhorrent and yeah. uh, did not do justice to you or to the son that you lost and not at all apologize not at all I yield back gentleman yields back before recognizing the gentleman from New York I, I, I see we're joined by one of our other colleagues the gentlelady from uh, from here in New York City Staten Island Miss Malley Takas thank you for joining us and, and for your concern about what's happening here we now recognize pursuant to the agreement reached with uh, Mr. Nadler's staff the gentleman from New York for two and a half minutes Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, and thank you, Mr. Johnson, for giving me some previous time. I want to continue uh, my, my previous statement. Uh, back in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, uh, this was a tough town. It was tough to live here. Crime was really very violent, and as I said earlier, during that period I had the opportunity to work for a victim services agency, providing services for crime victims. And I was also the president of the 34 Precinct Community Council. Uh, and, I, and if that's one thing that I really learned during that, that, those two decades, was that you cannot really simply take, talk about crime without talking about guns. You just can't do it because 80% of the homicides are committed by guns. Now, we're not minimizing the other 20%. They're also equally important. But 80% are committed by guns. This past Easter Sunday, a young man gets shot and killed on 137th Street, not too far where Mr. Alba used to work. Why? A gun. Just this weekend in Alabama, just this weekend, this Saturday, four people shot and killed with what? A gun. A shooter in a Louisville bank kills five people with who? With what? With a gun. The horrific elementary school shooting in Tennessee that left six people killed, including three children. With what? With a gun. Some of my colleagues, after that shooting, wore their AR-15 pins on their lapels and tie clips. I think mocking the death of those innocent kids. So a gun is the common denominator in eight out of ten Homicides, how can we take that away? We cannot do that. We must continue to fight for common sense gun law. And you know why? I'll ask you all that are here today. You want to find out why guns are not being talked about? Follow the money. Follow the money. Go into each and every one of our campaign accounts and figure out who's getting money from the NRA. Just follow the money. That's a, a phrase that's usually 
used on a common basis here in New York City. Very simple. Yeah. Who is the NRA supporting? Gentlemen, so gentlemen's time has expired. The, the, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Fry, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing today in one of the most iconic cities in the world, New York City. I want to especially thank the witnesses, the victims, for your bravery today. It is not easy to come here to talk about this in the public square, but thank you uh, for doing that. Uh, when people think of the United States, they think of this city, as was talked about earlier. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, but underneath all of those twinkling lights, something is not right in New York City. Shootings in Times Square, robberies in broad daylight, stabbings on the subway. I got into a cab yesterday, and the gentleman who was driving had been doing it for 25 years, and without knowing who I was or why I was here, he proceeded to talk about the city. And he said, this city has changed. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he immediately started talking about the crime. It's gotten so bad, it's out of control. This, unfortunately, is what we get in Joe Biden's America and Alvin Bragg's New York City. To the good people of New York, we hear you. We are here in New York today because we want to hear from you, and we hope that your local leaders start to listen to you as well. When the hearing was first noticed, the district attorney uh, released a statement that we were coming to the end, I quote, safest big city in America, and that this hearing was a political stunt. You want to know the real political stunt? Politicians in New York and other places continually pushing failed policies despite knowing that they don't work. Let's talk about this for a second. According to the New York Police Department, in Alvin Bragg's first year in public office in 2022, rapes are up 7 percent, felony assaults rose 13 percent, robberies spiked 26 percent, burglaries are up 23 percent, grand larceny is up 26 percent, auto theft has risen 32 percent, 170,000 felonies in New York City in 2022 alone, the most since 2006. Does that sound like the safest big city in America? I think not. The question is why? New York State eliminated cash bail for most crimes, tying the hands of judges and law enforcement. Alvin Bragg's day one memo, which outlined his office's position that he would not prosecute certain types of crimes. In addition, rather than approach each case on the facts of the offense committed, his office is focused on how much money you make, your circumstances, or your immigration status before deciding whether to charge a crime. And of course, as was already talked about, defunding $1 billion out of the New York Police Department's budget. 52% of felony charges are downgraded to misdemeanors in, di in this district attorney's office, the highest number in years. The felonies of the felonies they actually decide to prosecute, his office was only successful in securing the conviction on 50% of those, the lowest number in years. On misdemeanors, 29% of misdemeanor charges resulted in, uh, in conviction. If you listen to the district attorney, he sounds and acts more like a public defender than a prosecutor. If you want to defend criminals, be a public defender. If you want to change policy, run for the state assembly. Instead of partnering with the New York Police Department to prosecute these crimes, he seems hostile. It's no wonder that officers in the New York Police Department are resigning at a record rate. According to a recent article by the New York Post, there is a 117% increase in cops resigning in 2022 alone. That's the most since right after 9-11. Regarding New York's bail law, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice found that approximately 72% of violent felony offenders who were released without bail were rearrested. Recidivism is so bad in New York that 327 individuals were arrested for more than 6,000 crimes of retail theft. That's not giving somebody a second chance. That's letting them do the same thing over and over again to about 20 times and still letting them off the hook. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Maybe the 21st time they'll wake up. Mm -hmm. From an interview in January, District Attorney Bragg said he knows what's going on in the streets. Does he? It doesn't sound like it. Ms. Brame, I want to start with you and, and to the other victims. Who benefits more in this city, law-abiding citizens or criminals? Can you repeat that, please? Who benefits more in this city, law-abiding citizens or criminals? Oh, absolutely criminals, 100%. Ms. Harrison? Criminals. Mr. Borgen? Same Unfortun question. Unfortunately, it's the criminals who are getting all the, the perks. Ms. Bram, have you spoken to the district attorney about your son's case? Absolutely not. No response. If you could speak to him today about it, what would you say? <laughs> I would um, demand that he reopen that 
uh, gang assault and that murder case against Mary Saunders and Travis Stewart. If no one is above the law, prove it. Prove it by prosecuting them. Bring that case to trial. Thank you for your time today, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Brame, you said um, earlier that you are only hearing about Donald Trump from one side and not the other. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that that's very, very intentional because they know that they are using taxpayer money to defend a private citizen in his own criminal investigation and that that is an abuse of their power. The day before this investigation began, public reporting revealed that Donald Trump and his legal team directed House Republicans to initiate an investigation into Alvin Bragg. And they're now scrambling to justify this investigation with after-the-fact explanations, including the preposterous explanation that he spent $5,000 of federal money on this years-long investigation. They have spent many multiples of that amount of money on this hearing alone in order to hold it in Manhattan. Now, I've asked the chairman and other members of House leadership to tell the American public what kind of collusion they have been doing with Donald Trump to use the power of this committee and of this Congress to interfere in this prosecution. They have thus far refused. But we will learn about that collusion because the Manhattan District Attorney has a lawsuit against the chairman, and they will be able to compel disclosure of the communication and coordination as part of that lawsuit. But that's why we are here, and that's what we want to emphasize to you. And we're not insulting you. Your, your experiences are devastating. But the problem is, is that this is a charade to cover up for an abuse of power that they are going around talking incessantly outside of this hearing about Donald Trump. And the purpose of this hearing is to cover up for what they know to be an inappropriate investigation. Now, I look forward, many of you are Can I in respond New York to City. You, please? No, not right now, because I only have 20 seconds. I'm sorry. But I, I do want to talk. Don't insult my intelligence. That, I, you're I, not hang on, hang on. The gentleman's talking. I'm not insulting you. You're trying to insult me time. like I'm not aware of Ms. what's going Ms. on Brain. here. Thank you. Okay? I, I'm fully to the, aware of what's going on here. Gentlemen, we'll suspend. Okay? Gentleman gets another 15 seconds. Thank you. That's why I walked away from the plantation of the Democratic Party. Committee will be in order. Ms. Brame, what, what I was about to say is that as a representative of this city, I look forward to working with you, with Ms. Harrison, Mr. Holden, Mr. Borgen, all of you who are involved and engaged in our criminal justice system. Because, as I said and my colleagues have referenced, Gentlemen, we do expired. have a problem Gentlemen's not only time. in New York City but around the country. Gentlemen's time so hopefully expired. we can Gentlemen work together back. to make, reach real solutions, not charades like this. General Lady, from, this. Uh, and General lady from New York, Ms. Devonick, is recognized for five minutes. Mm -hmm. As a native New Yorker born and bred, uh, I think it's important to note that many of the Democrats on this committee have smeared brave victims and fellow New Yorkers here today, calling them props, a circus, a performance, MAGA Broadway pops, and an underlying sham. What have Republicans focused on? We've focused on giving victims a voice. We've focused on crimes. We've focused on your story as a father, visiting your son at the hospital, seeing his face beaten in with an anti-Semitic hate crime. We're focused, Ms. Brame, on your story as a mother, grieving the loss, rightfully grieving the loss, and advocating on behalf of your son and his legacy. Ms. Harrison, we heard your story about losing your loved one. And Mr. Alba, we heard your story just the personal challenges you've faced dealing with the consequences of the vicious crime committed, perpetrated against you. And in addition to House Democrats belittling the victims here today, Democrats have politicized this hearing, mentioning Donald Trump 38 times. That number for Republicans is zero. We are focused on victims and making sure that we support law and order in this country. There is a catastrophic crime crisis across America, specifically in our great cities and great cities like New York. New Yorkers know it. Americans know it. And while Democrats on this committee may claim that New York is not the epicenter, look no further than the last November election where we flipped four congressional seats delivering the House majority. What was the number one issue? It was crime. 
because voters are smart, the people are smart. Mr. DiGiacomo, as a member, as a longtime member of law enforcement, I wanted to get your testimony today. How long have you served in law enforcement? Uh, approximately 40 years. And in those 40 years, would you say the crime crisis today is worse than you've ever seen it? That's correct. Crime is up. Is it fair to say that it is a result of failed bail reform policies in Albany and Alvin Bragg's day one memo? 100%. And here are some important numbers. In 2022, District Attorney Bragg's first year as DA, New York City saw a 23% surge in major crimes. Is that true? That's correct. From 2019 to 2022, murders are up 93%. That's correct. From 2019 to 2022, robberies are up 43%. Correct. Felony assaults are up 32%. Correct. And it's fair to say that law enforcement strongly opposed Bragg's day one memo and failed bail reform policies in Albany. 100%. Mr. Giacomo, in fact, you have said, quote, Bragg gives criminals the roadmap to freedom from prosecution and control of our streets. In Bragg's Manhattan, you can arrest, deal drugs, obstruct arrests, and even carry a gun to get away with it. Can you please expound about why law enforcement opposes Alvin Bragg's day one policy and opposes failed bail reform? Well, because, again, uh, every time a detective or a police officer uh, puts himself in, or herself in harm's way, arresting a felon or anyone for any crime, uh, they're released immediately with no consequences. Mr. Borgen, as a family member of a victim of a heinous violent crime, your son, as you talked about, was a victim of a violent anti-Semitic hate crime committed at a pro-Israel event. Your son was jumped, beaten, and sprayed with mace. In fact, and I think it's important for the American people and my colleagues across the aisle to hear this, your son describes this as, a whole crowd of people proceeded to kick me, punch me, beat me down. I felt a liquid being poured on my face, and at first I thought I was getting urinated on, but it turned out I was getting maced and pepper sprayed. My face was on fire. That pain was worse than the concussion and all this other stuff that followed. And yet the attacker, the attacker said, if I could do it again, I would do it again. And yet, District Attorney Alvin Bragg gave him a sweetheart deal. What is your message to District Attorney Alvin Bragg? Well, the man is incompetent, obviously, in the big scheme, in the big scheme of things. But unfortunately, you know, our hands are tied. He, he, he can come to us. He, he offered him other deals. My son did not accept them. Um, right now, the court case is pending and different deals are passing on from back and forth. But, you know, between me and you, I lost, I lost faith in the justice system with Alvin Bragg. I don't feel anything's going to get done. Like in the other cases also, uh, her son's attackers walking around scot-free like nothing happened. It's a disgrace. And I just want to say to you, Mr. Ivey, I compliment you. You're the only one who sat here on the Democratic side, didn't bring up Donald Trump. And, I, and you're a mensch. You, you talk straight. You didn't, you didn't look to make partisan politics here. I want to compliment you. Ms. Harrison, what's your message to Alvin Bragg? I'm a walking example of not ever being whole 18 years after losing a loved one under horrific circumstances and not seeing justice. My life will never ever be complete without Kevin and knowing that his fam the murderer's families are walking free, spending Christmases and Easter's with their family is, it, it, it's beyond comprehension. So I hope that he will pay attention to what's happening here today and realize the effect that he's having on survivors of homicide victims for the rest of their lives. Thank you to the victims for the bravery sharing your stories. Thank you to our former law enforcement officers for your leadership. Yield back. General Lee yields back just to the witnesses. We ha now we'll just be on this side. I think we've, the Democrats have all went. Um, it's about 40 more minutes. If you've got to step out, just please let us know. But we want every member to get a chance to talk to, to you. If you need to step out, please just excuse yourself. And Capitol Police, make sure you know where, where you're going out there. With that, I yield to the gentleman from – five minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. I thank the chairman. Um, much has been made about why we are in New York City. Um, in a memorable moment shortly before he was elected, former Mayor Rudolph Giuliani told an editorial board meeting he cared about statistics, but the real measure would be whether people actually feel safer. That, he said, was the ultimate test of policing and political leadership. He said that in 1993 when, the New, York, when New York was averaging 2,000 murders a year. By 2013, it was down to 333 due to the uh, strong support of law enforcement and the anti-crime policies adopted by the city. Got down to 288 by 2018, but now it is back up to the mid-400s. I think this is the question, is whether or not you feel safe. 
And the question I'd ask of Ms. Brain, Ms. Harrison, others, do you feel safe in New York City right now? No. Mr. Alba, do you feel safe in New York City? And uh, Mr. Giacomo, uh, your history in law enforcement, you said it's as safe, as unsafe as you've ever seen it today in New York. Yes, that's correct. And isn't that the ultimate measure? Isn't that the question? And I think one of the things that I think merits um, focusing on is the question that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been talking about in terms of jurisdiction. What is the jurisdiction here? Mr. Giacomo, are you familiar with 922G and 924C in the federal code? No, I'm not. I'm sorry. 922G being felons in possession, 924C being the ability to be able to go after somebody and give it a heightened sentencing for their use of firearms and crimes. And my question here, we might suspend. The committee will suspend. The, the gentleman is, is recognized <laughs> to continue. All right, so we're back on. Uh, 922G and 924C, these are federal crimes, right? And they're federal crimes that we have programs like Project Safe Neighborhoods that work with local law enforcement where we have the United States Attorney's Office in coordination to try to combat crime and the use of firearms in crimes. Now, I suppose we could go through and look at the laundry list of legislation that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have introduced to repeal said federal laws that these federal laws should not exist. Now, we want to have a debate about federalism about that. Happy to have it. But we're not doing that, are we? Because that's not what this is about. It's about show. The fact is we do have federal laws on the books to go after criminal uh, misuse of firearms, but they're not being enforced. And they're also not being enforced at the local level. Those are the facts. And the facts are we are letting criminals out of jail. If you look at the data, the data is clear of uh, the average criminal has 11 prior arrests, five we, criminal convictions. 77% have five need the plus. Crowd to be quiet, please. Thank you. Five plus prior arrests. 74% have prior violent arrests. 30% have prior arrests for guns and weapon offenses. Even though these individuals have lengthy criminal records, records 52% served a year or less. 60% are rearrested within two years of release. The fact is, we have a recidivism problem. And we have now gone down the road of decarceration. Hundreds of thousands of criminals have been released. Just since 2020, the incarcerated population is down about 300,000. When it was 2.1 million, which by the way, was pretty far down from the levels when we had the safest numbers in the safest streets in the city. But this isn't about some libertarian worldview of letting out a few potheads who are allegedly rotting in jail. 88% of prisoners are incarcerated in the state systems for murder, rape, robbery, and assault. It's responsible for most of those sentences. A mere 14% are in custody primarily for narcotics offenses, and the vast majority of these are felony trafficking crimes and misdemeanor possession. My question is for you, Mr. Giacomo, is do you think that we have a problem uh, with uh, – the gun issue, or do you think we have a problem with letting criminals out on the streets? Well, we are, the criminals are being let out at an alarming rate. And I just want to make it clear here that the, the guns, I'm speaking for New York City, the guns that are being used here in New York City are illegal guns. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're illegal guns that are, that are uh, brought here into New York City and being used uh, to victimize the people. And are they being prosecuted heavily by the DA here? No, they're not. Right. And isn't that the problem? That is a major problem. And are they being prosecuted in coordination with the United States Attorney's Office using 922G, 922G and 924C to prosecute it? Not that I'm aware of, no. Right. And isn't that fundamentally the problem? Correct. Um, question I have, my colleagues on the side of aisle mentioned former President Trump a number of times. I would just ask, was it former President Trump, Ms. Brame, that killed your son? No. Ms. Harrison, was it former President Trump that killed your loved ones? No. Was it former President Trump that stabbed Mr. Alba? No. Was it former President Trump that prosecuted Mr. Alba and prosecuted him for defending himself? No. No. 
I yield back. The chair recognizes the representative from Texas, Mr. Niels. Thank you, Chair Willie. <coughs> All right, check, check. All right, as a um, former law enforcement officer for 30 years, sheriff of a large county in the great state of Texas, what I've seen happening in our country is disturbing and should be a concern to all of us. Crime is at an all-time high. The American people can't trust, can't trust their government. And the left wants to defund the police because law enforcement shootings where police acted inappropriately, those officers were rightly charged and sentenced. What we saw in 2020 with riots, rioting across our country, led to numerous attacks on law enforcement and citizens with hundreds of millions of dollars in damage to buildings. The left will rally their troops, they'll rally them, they'll get them all together in the name of social justice, but little is being made of the hundreds, the hundreds of victims of crime in Chicago and New York and other large cities run by liberals because the victims and suspects of those crimes are predominantly black, and in those cases, black lives don't matter. Right. They don't matter. Shame on them. Mm and the dishonest media. The dishonest media is the greatest threat, folks. You in the back, you are the greatest threat to this country. And we've seen it, and the American people know it. Most people on the left, if not in this room, you've heard of Eric Gardner. I'm sure you've heard of him. You've heard of George Floyd. You've heard of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown. You've heard of all those names. But what about the hundreds of innocent victims in Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore. You'll never hear their name. You'll never hear their name. Shameful. If you've watched the news lately, it's no shocker. Alvin Bragg likes to prosecute. He's even a fan of increasing misdemeanors to felonies for certain individuals he don't like. Some of those individuals, he said, he's the greatest danger to our country. Mr. Bragg, I hope you're watching. I hope you're watching today, sir. You're a disgrace. You're a danger to this country, and I will do everything I can in my power to hold you accountable. Your job, Mr. Bragg, is to protect the residents here in Manhattan and decreasing felonies to misdemeanors. Decreasing felonies to misdemeanors and is dangerous and places the victim last. Mr. Kessler, I'll start with you. You work for Senator Schumer and other members on crime policy, that's great. So I want to get your perspective on this day one memo. You're familiar? Uh, you familiar with this? I am not. You're not familiar with this day one memo and you come here today? I should provide you a copy. According to the D Manhattan DA, the aim of the day one memo is to reduce Manhattan's over-incarceration issue and to deliver safety and fairness for all. And so I ask you, you're, familiar, you're not familiar with the memo. The day one memo stated, the DA's office will not prosecute minor offenses that, quote, have no, have no impact on public safety, end quote. So let's talk about some of the things Alvin Bragg considers minor offenses. Resisting arrest. Can you tell me how not prosecuting? This makes New York safer. Resisting arrest. I'd have to say. We're not going to prosecute it in New okay. York. We're not going to do it. All right. We're not going to do it. Did you ever ask law enforcement? Mr. Giangio, how do you feel about that? How do your law enforcement officers feel about not prosecuting resisting arrest? They weren't happy about it. That's well, you wonder why 1,400 officers left New York PD in 2022. Why in the hell would you work here? I'd go out into the suburbs where you have, you can go out there and fight crime and be respected. You're not getting that in these large cities such as Manhattan. You want to defund NYPD a billion dollars in 2020, and you wonder why we are in the state of emergency we are in. Mr. Bragg laid out five sections of law that covers armed robberies and says New York will not prosecute them. In short, according to this memo, if you hold a gun to a clerk's face and ask, Empty the trash, empty the, the cash register, sir. We are going to take that, and that's going to be a misdemeanor, no big deal. That's no big deal. How do you feel about that, Mr. Kessler? What if I come over there and I put a 
my pistola and screw it in your ear. And I don't say anything bad to you, and we're just going to say, Mr. Niles, that's just a misdemeanor here in the great state of New York. Well, that has happened to me. Well, sad, isn't it? How would you feel about that? I was pretty scared. Pretty scared. Yes. But we're going to consider that a misdemeanor here in, the great, in, in, in New York. It's unacceptable. It's disgraceful. And I wish I had more time. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes the uh, congressman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> pretrial release decisions. New York State law requires an annual report of pretrial release decisions made by New York City courts. Uh, the latest data released in September of 2022 shows that statistics of pretrial release granted to individuals across all categories of offense between 2019 and 2021. Here's a few takeaways from that. Uh, since New York City repealed cash bail for certain nonviolent felonies in 2019, the instances of imposing bail have decreased across all categories of offense, including violent felonies. Release was granted in more than 75% of nonviolent felony cases in 2021. And of those released, 40% went on to commit another crime within 180 days, uh -huh. with 10% of those being violent uh, felonies. Uh -huh. In those cases where bail was actually set, which in 2020, 2021 was about 12,000 cases, more than 3,700 of those had bail set at $1. Um, I wanted to highlight those statistics for a couple of reasons. The first is to show that weak bail policies in New York City do, in fact, have an effect on violent crime. Thousands of violent felony offenders are being released under their own reconnaissance, or in some cases, like I said, for a dollar. And then within six months, are back in front of the same judge. And then the second is to say that the pretrial release statistics play an important role in helping the public, and Congress actually, understand whether a state's bail policies are contributing to a spike in violent crime. So I asked this, and I asked Congress, that we should take up a bill, a bill that we've worked on in past Congresses, and the Pretrial Release Reporting Act, so we can see how other state bail policies are contributing to really an epidemic that's nationwide right now. So, uh, Ms. Harrison, I was, I was going to ask you, can you just comment kind of in general on pretrial release statistics and, and the issues related to that? not just in New York, but nationwide. I mean, as you mentioned, we see it across the board all over the news that people are killed or victimized by people that are released under pretrial, uh, uh, you know, least restrictive conditions, bail reform, cashless bail, whatever you want to call it. We have over 305 people that are dead in New York because of bail reform. Um, Christina Lee was murdered here in New York by somebody that was on supervised release, uh, which really is non-existent. So across the board, across the country, it, it's awful, and it's victimizing people. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, um, I just wanted to get your opinion on how these type of pretrial decisions erodes the relationship between uh, law enforcement and the district attorney's office. Well, I've always remembered the police and the district attorney's office work together uh, to help the victims of crime. Uh, I don't see that happening in Manhattan, and it's, it's caused more people to die. It's got to be disheartening for officers on the street to go out, do their job on a daily basis, make the arrests, do the right thing, put their lives at stake, and then find out on the back end that the DA didn't follow through on either prosecuting or at the end of the day, kind of a slap in the face when you find out that they were released on a $1 decision? Well, absolutely. And like I said earlier, every time you uh, engage uh, the criminal element, you're putting your life in arm's way. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I think Yep. Yep. I yield to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you. Uh, when I think of victims of crime, being a sheriff, having to deal with it pretty much all my life, and I think about an individual having to protect himself, and, and when you have some type of a knucklehead, we got one over here on this poster board, Mr. Alba, you have to deal with this. This guy's in your face. I felt, you felt scared, didn't you? Did you feel this guy was going to possibly kill you? Maybe cause serious bodily injury, if not death? 
then you have a right, you have a right as an American citizen to use deadly force sir, and eliminate that threat. You have a right to do that. Everybody in this room would agree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, when Will is the gentleman it okay yield for America? one minute? For when a second, it? sir? Will you yield over here? When is it, when can we look at, if somebody puts a knife to you or a clerk at a cashier anywhere in this country and he's threatening to say, I'm going to kill you, you don't give your money? I would encourage the residents in the great state of Texas and my county to defend yourself. Defend yourself. You are given that God-given right. And that means pulling out a weapon and put two at center mass. You'll reduce recidivism, won't you? And you won't have a repeat offender. Gentlemen, time has expired. The gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Sparks, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was <laughs> always, I'm the other person that always believed that um, the greatest of our country is the freedoms and greatness of our people. And someone who came from a communist country, it appalled me what's happened in our country. And I said that, unfortunately, Congress became a circus and charade. Unfortunately, what's happened in your district is also a circus and charade. And I appreciate people being here, Mr. Alba, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Bray, mm -hmm. uh, and actually sharing your personal story. And I apologize on the beh behalf of the Congress. I also appreciate Mr. Holden sitting here and actually willing to challenge your own party. I actually do it quite a lot, and a lot of people in your party don't have that strength, and I hope we can see more of that. You know, I, on the way here, uh, one of my um, constituents texted me. We had police officer suicide. We had police officer killed <coughs> um, in the district last year. We have a serious problem with our criminal justice system. Our government is set up to protect people's rights to life, liberty, and property, and it's not doing it. People play in politics, and it is one of the core functions, and this committee has that function. So I appreciate Mr. Chairman actually having field hearing. I actually appreciate my Democrat colleagues showed up this time, because I hope we'll do more. Because the city of Indianapolis has higher murder rates than the city of Chicago, and we have a Democrat prosecutor, he is not enforcing the crimes. You know, the laws. And what the problem is what we have right now, and I actually agree with Mr. Goldman and Lofgren about jurisdiction, it's a challenge. I want to hear what we can do, what we shouldn't be doing, and I hope we'll have more discussion about jurisdiction because we're overreaching significantly on the state's rights, and a former state senator, I have a huge problem with that. I also agree with, you know, at least appreciate Mr. Ivey said, you know what, it's all about gun control. At least he's honest, okay? Not like do all this talking points, like I was listening to TV this morning. They already say, oh, committee came about talking about all the break. I honestly don't give about him. I actually care what is happening in this country. And I think it's important for us to hear from we the people because people are not heard in D.C. There is no lobby for the people in Washington, D.C. So hopefully you'll start being more active in that. I also think, you know, Mr. Aspiat said follow the money. I actually would like to follow the money. Why are we not dealing with hospital monopolies that Chuck Schumer is supporting so much? Why are we not dealing with a border situation that all those NGOs get money? Who knows what the hell they're doing with that? And why we have the crisis with all those situations? But I want to try to ask you, you know, if we want to find common ground, I actually, on the criminal justice subcommittee, tried to do some pass some laws on a bipartisan basis. But is there is any in your party except gun control? I know that, Ms. Fisher, you mentioned about, you know, the, the safe storage and everything. I just don't see anything how, my, how I am and my kids are going to be safer if I lock up my guns. I just feel, actually, as a female, I feel not as safe. And I don't know how long overwhelmed police officers will take them now to get to help us. So I think we now, it's really strange for me, we try to take, you know, protection from law-abiding citizens and believe that criminals are not going to get gun. I mean, there is anything else except gun control. Maybe we should reform education and have some wraparound preventive services and have more competition in education that these kids actually taught some values that don't have a 10% or 8% literacy rate that they have to get into gangs. Is there anything else you can say except gun control? So comprehensive solutions to reducing violence in New York City have actually been incredibly effective. And that's yeah, why like, if, I set the, if I set the record straight, because we've been talking a lot about statistics, uh -huh. the NYPD's own data has shown that shootings are down well, in the first quarter, 19%. It doesn't sound like Homicides you have also, are down 9%. Okay, Mr. Kessler, my, my question for you. You've been talking a lot about trafficking and, you know, 
I was going to be talking about child trafficking, human trafficking, drug trafficking on the border and cartels actually doing what this gun violence associated with them. Can we find common ground on that? Let me try to... I mean, is cartel not a problem? Can you tell me the trafficking of guns done by Mexican cartels that now we're subsidized with taxpayers' money? Is it not a problem? Can we find a common ground on that? Perhaps. If, if I but let, let, let's talk about that. I mean, why cannot we talk about that? If I, if I could just have 30 seconds to okay. answer. Well, I don't have 30 seconds, but... Back in the Wayback Machine, I helped with Chuck Schumer, worked on the 1994 crime bill, which I know not everybody loves, but one of the things about that crime, it was huge, it was comprehensive, it was one of the things that brought down crime in this country, but one of the most important things about that crime bill, Schumer gets a lot of credit for it, Henry Hyde, the Republican ranking member worked on it closely with Schumer, too. It was a bipartisan effort, and solutions was taken but, from both sides. And but let's talk about perfect, it, but, but we crime, right now not do it. My, my time is expired, but we need to stop playing politics with people's life. I yield back. Yeah. General Lady yields back. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Uh, Moore, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me say first, I, I appreciate you having this hearing, and let me set the record straight for the people in New York. This is not the first hearing on crime we've had since Mr. Jordan's been chairman. A few weeks ago, we went to Yuma, Arizona. We, 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 we saw where people were coming across the border. You know, 106 different nations, 107,000 fentanyl deaths. We talk about mass shootings. We only had 74 people killed by mass shootings last year in America. We're losing more than that today and just in this hearing along to fentanyl poisoning. So we've been out here, and we're going to go to other areas where there's crime, and we're going to have hearings because it's a concern. I mean, Victoria's right. We have to begin to address these issues that are threatening American citizens. And so, Ms. Brame, you actually took one of my talking points a while ago. Crime, the, the criminal does not differentiate between a Republican and a Democrat. You know, I was stabbed a few years ago, and I was glad the DA actually charged the man for attempted murder and put him behind bars. It made us all feel a little safer. And so thank you for being here. Ms. Harrison, thank you for being here. Mr. Alba, thank you for being here. And, and Mr. Giacomo, I want to talk to you a little bit about just what we're seeing with the, the rules, the DA came in with this, this new rules, this set of rules, and uh, are you seeing officers retire now and go into other lines of work as a result of the policies? Well, I lost uh, 600 detectives re retired uh, this year alone. Uh, just to give a, a clear consensus on what that means, in 2001, in the terrorist attacks, we had 7,500 detectives. Uh, right now, I'm working with 5,400 detectives, and we're doing more investigative steps now than we were done then because of the um, video canvases, and we're also doing counterterrorism duties as well here in New York City. What do you think the primary reason the, 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 the detectives, you're losing that experience level, why are they leaving? Well, you know, when you're a detective, you investigate crimes, and sometimes it takes months uh, to investigate those crimes, and there are reports that are this high, uh, and the detective puts many, many hours and days and weeks sometimes investigating those crimes uh, just for the individual to be let go. Uh, and they're getting frustrated. And they are frustrated is the real uh, and, fact. And I guess they risk these lives that they're investigating these crimes as well. And always, they risk always. Their health. Yes, always. You know, New York City detectives uh, do any, everything from patrol uh, to climb the bridges and everything in between, homicide, special victims, uh, narcotics divisions. So uh, detectives uh, and all police officers here in New York City do very dangerous work, uh, 24 hours a day. Mr. Giacomo, I got a question. You know, I find it interesting that when a law enforcement officer uses a weapon to defend himself or, or even in pursuit of a criminal, mm. it's always the law enforcement officer's fault. But when it's the criminal using the gun, it's always the gun's fault. How do we address that in, in society? Why does the left always drive that narrative? Well, it's very, it's very simple. It's the person that is handling the gun. It's the criminal element that's using the gun and victimizing other people here in New York City and across this country. So it, in some sense, it must be the person, the individual responsible, not the law enforcement officer himself. 100 percent. How do you find a man that, or a lady that wants to be law enforcement officer if she pulls her weapon in a life-threatening situation and she shoots somebody, she's going to be tried for murder or he's going to be tried for some sort of crime, but if he doesn't pull his weapon, he ends up dying. How do you recruit people to go into that industry? It's a dying profession. 
That, that's, you know, it's scary for me, for, for our society in general. If we yeah. cannot recruit good law enforcement officers, then they're crucified by the left and the mm -hmm. media when they act to save themselves or their partners' lives. Well, and if I may, yes, please. Uh, there's, there's no uh, no profession, at least here in New York City, that has more oversight than the New York City Police Department. Mm -hmm. There are about ten levels of oversight, uh, and no one else has that level of oversight uh, like the New York City Police Department. And, you know, it's, it's typically in society, and, and this is for, you know, all folks in blue cities or any other cities, you know, often they want to disarm law-abiding citizens. And they say, well, call the police. If you, if, if you have an intruder, call the police. And then at the same time, they're defunding the police. What kind of situation, Ms. Harrison, does that put society in when you, you can't defend yourself? A horrible situation, and at the same time, in, in the name of ending mass incarceration, as they like to gaslight everybody with, they're releasing very violent recidivists with no oversight because they're removing any kind of parole supervision, bail supervision. So we really, we do need to be, be able to defend ourselves in some way, shape, or form. Is that weapon, I mean, my daughters have concealed carry permits. It, is it, it's the equalizer, correct? For a lady who's being attacked by an assailant who's much bigger, much heavier, much stronger, does it not equalize the playing field? I, I believe it does. Thank you. With that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, witnesses, we just got a few more, but these are very important members, uh, great, great people, and we're going to go now with the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for being here. Um, I represent the state of Wyoming. There are 560,000 people in my state. I grew up outside of a town of 350 people. I currently live in our largest city of 60,000 people. I want you to know, Mr. Alba, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Brame, Mr. Bergen, we pay a lot of attention to what goes on here. Mm -hmm. We know about you. When I read about your situation, Mr. Alba, and what happened to you the next day after it happened, I prayed for you. I prayed for your family. As I read the testimony that you have provided to us today, it makes my heart break to know that you as family members have gone through something so devastating. But to make it even worse, our criminal justice system has treated you as so poorly since that you have gone through these things. I will tell you, it has been interesting to listen to you talk about your loved ones, talk about the fear that you faced with this situation, Mr. Alba, the loss that you're still suffering from 18 years later after losing your loved one, how much love you have for your son, how much love you have for your son and your family and your community. And I do want you to know that we're not here for grandstanding. We're not here for anything other than the fact that we're recognizing that across the country there is a sickness pervading our communities that is destroying who and what we are. And it's not just about guns. I watched you, Ms. Fisher, as you secretly smiled at some of the, uh, the, the Congress members on the other side as people on our side talked about the, the gun issue. Uh, I, I, I understand you believe that it is an inanimate object that somehow can, can create the, or cause the, 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 the mass shootings, that it's not the individual. One of the things that has struck me today is that as we talk about these mass shootings, nobody has talked about the drugs that these people were on. Nobody has talked talked about the psychology of this. We just had a woman in uh, shoot and kill three young children and three teachers, and yet no one has talked about what kind of drugs she may have been taking, what kind of psychosis she was suffering from. Clearly she was suffering from a psychosis. She claimed that she was a boy when she was a girl. We have to be looking at those kinds of things. It's not the guns. It's what we're teaching in school. It's the rot in our culture. It is the fact that we are losing our society because we're unwilling to recognize that there is evil, and when there's evil, we need to address it. When someone does something to your family members that is illegal, we need to take them off the streets. We don't need to try to figure out uh, what, what may have happened in their background. If they've done something, if they've stabbed a beautiful young man as they did your son, they need to be taken off the street and they need to be punished. We need to protect our law-abiding citizens and we need to protect our communities. We also need to protect our, our police officers. Um, Mr. Uh, DiGiacomo, the thing that has struck me as I listen to the testimony is the fear that I have, and you were just speaking with it a moment ago uh, with my colleague, Mr. Moore, about the impact that this is having on our, on our law enforcement officers, and you said something that was extremely jarring, which is it's a dying, it, it's a dying profession. And what that means is we're heading toward anarchy and lawlessness. When I was driving in last night from the airport, what struck me as I drove down the streets of this city that I love, 
I've spent a lot of time in New York City. Coming from Wyoming, I love this city. But what I started seeing out the window was almost an escape from New York feel. We don't want our big cities to die. We don't want to lose the culture that we have here. We in Wyoming love New York. We love Portland. We love Austin, Texas. We love these places. They're part of our culture and the fabric of our society. But we have to address the fact that there are people who are willing to kill and stab and hurt other people. And it is the responsibility of our law enforcement and our prosecutors to make sure that they can't hurt anyone else. With that, I want to tell you there have been many times today that you've been called victims, and I don't see you as victims. I see you as very, very brave, brave mm -hmm. people awesome. for Billy being willing to come in here today and tell your story and make sure that everybody in this country knows your names and knows the names of your family members. Well With said. that, I yield back. Well said. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hunt, is recognized. I cannot... Thank you all enough for being here. Thank you for sharing your lives with us. Thank you for sharing your stories. I greatly appreciate it and being from Texas. It's an honor to be in your presence. Uh, in, in the 90s, the late, mid to late 90s, uh, New York City was considered one of the safest cities in America. Uh, when I was at West Point from 2000 through 2004, I took that train down here many, many, many a day. Had a pretty good time in this city, and I felt relatively safe when I did just that. But while Alvin, while Alvin Bragg is a Manhattan district attorney, his policies are not isolated to this borough. His pro-criminal policies are just an example of what Soros-funded district attorneys are implementing across our great nation. Their ideology is responsible for the death, rape, and robbery of innocent people across America, and it is disproportionately impacting poor black and brown people. In Democrat run cities across America, criminals are given deference and victims are left to fend for themselves, as you have articulated today. Why do these Soros funded district attorneys put criminals first and victims last? It's what they believe, it's who they are. Our cities are crumbling around us, criminals are running rampant. And that's because district attorneys in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and even my home city of Houston are advocating for pro criminal policies. And Alvin Bragg fits this profile in my humble opinion. Let's talk about Alvin Bragg. He's a woke, progressive district attorney with no different than any other progressive DA in our country right now. He was elected as a Manhattan DA in 2021. His policies should not be surprising, given that he was heavily supported by Black Lives Matters PAC that was directly funded by George Soros. In fact, George Soros donated $1 million to that PAC less than a week after endorsing Bragg. Under the guise of helping people of color, he causes them more harm with his pro-criminal policies. Since Bragg has taken office, New York City residents are worried about increasing threats of violence. Do you know who doesn't have to worry about violence? Alvin Bragg. Bragg is surrounded by men with guns every single day. But if you're a regular New Yorker coming home late at night on the subway, you may be robbed, stabbed, raped, or even pushed in front of a train. Do you know what the fastest growing demographic of gun ownership is in America? Black women. Black women. Why? Because they know they have to protect themselves in Democrat-run cities where criminals are allowed to roam free. That is a fact. Now, many of my colleagues on the left like to say that our justice system is two-tiered, that it favors the powerful and connected at the expense of poor people of color. But in Bragg's office, there's a two-tiered justice system. It's criminals first and victims second, especially victims of color. We have an opportunity to vote out DAs just like this, to make people that look like me and you, ma'am, safer. Let me take it one step further. Not just people that look like you and me. Every single American that lives in this country should feel safe to live in their own streets. End of discussion. I'm sitting here right now, and I'm hearing Trump, 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 Trump. And at the end of the day, the people that are sitting here right now, they don't want to hear that. The only thing you want is safety. We are not grandstanding. I am not grandstanding. I can assure you, I would love to be holding my four-month-old boy right now. 
But I am here to fight for you and to hear your stories and to allow you to tell your stories. And for that, I am forever grateful. And ma'am, you ain't the only one that's, that's actually left the uh, plantation. It's happening all over the country. <laughs> and with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Kiley is recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In recent years, we have seen a movement to fundamentally change America's approach to law and order by defunding police departments and by putting so-called progressive prosecutors in district attorney's offices. Uh, Mr. DiGiacomo, you are the head of the uh, New York Detectives Endowment Association. Uh, what connection do you see between these two things, defund the police and progressive prosecutors? Well, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're following uh, the progressive line and not backing the police, not uh, caring about the victims, and uh, putting the criminal element back out onto the street to victimize the people of, uh, of this uh, city and state and country. That's right. Both seek to eliminate or neutralize uh, the capabilities of law enforcement, correct? Uh, well, it's, it's been compromised already. That's right. And thereby removing or reducing the consequences of criminal activity, correct? Mm, correct. So these policies have uh, gained a major foothold in several cities, including uh, the one that we're in right now. So we can assess what the impact has been. And one way to assess that impact, of course, is looking at the effect on crime rates. Uh, now, Mr. Holden, you're an elected uh, city council member uh, in New York, a uh, member of the Democratic uh, Party, and uh, you testified today about failed progressive policies. So just to be clear, when you say these are failed progressive policies, uh, is that because they've caused crime to go up or to go down? Uh, again, uh, I'm a critic of, of my party's stance on, on crime. It, everything's gone up. All their policies have led to an increase in crime. And, and I think we saw it come to a head with um, the war on police that, that started after George Floyd, and it went national. And so you saw this kind of crime wave go throughout the entire country. That's right. And in fact, if you look at uh, yesterday's New York Times, uh, it reported that major crime in New York this year is 45% up from two years ago. This is from the New York Times. And to your point, in Los Angeles, violent crime is 86% higher than the national average. In San Francisco, overall crime is 111% higher than the national average. So you can also then look to assess the impact uh, of these policies uh, how, about how people are responding to them. Uh, would you say, Council uh, Member Holden, that these failed progressive policies have caused more people to move to New York City or to move away from New York City? Certainly away from New York City. I've never seen it this bad. Like I said, I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s in New York, and I saw horrific crime numbers, but now it's much, much worse because it's all over. The, the, the lawlessness, mayhem is all over. And in fact, uh, the state of New York is second in the nation in terms of one-way U-Haul and rentals, people who are leaving. Uh, first place, of course, is California now, uh, three years running. Uh, Los Angeles County, where George Gascon is the district attorney, accounts for half the people leaving California. And San Francisco, its population is declining faster than any major city in U.S. history. Now, a final way we can assess the impact of these policies is by the judgment of voters. Uh, Councilmember Holden, would you say that, uh, mayoral, uh, that Mayor Eric Adams uh, made the issue of crime a, success, a plank in his, major plank in his successful campaign for mayor? Well, th that was and, and, and certainly is, but he's not getting much support from his colleagues. Correct. And in Los Angeles, uh, George Gascon has been subject to a vote of no confidence by 36 different city councils within his jurisdiction. And San Francisco voters went so far as to recall their pro progressive prosecutor from office overwhelmingly. Now, this is not a red city. The Trump-Pence ticket got 12 percent in San Francisco, and yet voters overwhelmingly recalled that progressive prosecutor. And so the verdict is very clear that these policies have led to crime skyrocketing, to people fleeing, and they're being rejected by voters. And yet today, on the other side of the table, we have by and large saw members of Congress standing by those policies. And for folks who are watching, and for that matter, the victims and the families who are here today, it must be disheartening. But I'd say it's actually not as bleak as it sounds, that in fact the voices that we have heard today on the other side are not representative. And for proof of that, just look what happened in D.C. after the city council there passed a reckless crime bill. In the House majority, we passed legislation to undo what the D.C. city council had done, 
President Biden sided with us and signed that bill. Two out of three Democrat senators sided with us and voted for that bill. Do you know how many members of this committee on in the minority voted for that bill? Just one. Every single other member voted to keep the reckless pro-criminal D.C. crime bill in place. So I would say there's a lot more consensus in this country right now than today's hearing uh, makes out, uh, and that the pendulum is swinging back towards supporting victims, supporting law enforcement, supporting law and order, and I look forward to working with people of good faith on both sides of the aisle to restore sanity to our criminal justice system. Gentlemen's time's expired. Mr. Brands, recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the great, there's a greatness in America that has often been reflected over the history of our nation by the greatness in some of our largest cities, like New York City, like Philadelphia, like a couple cities in my state, Austin and Houston, to name a few. But widespread movements in these cities to focus support for criminals instead of victims, to put progressive liberal politics ahead of the lives of all individuals, regardless of political affiliation, to put sound bites ahead of sound policy, and to focus on social justice rather than actual justice have resulted in these Democrat-run city, cities, like New York City, being less safe. Of course, if you're talking about the safety and protection of criminals, that's different. Mr. Jim, uh, G uh, Giacomo, uh, let me see if I understand a couple of statistics correctly, and I'll ask you a couple questions about this. When it relates to uh, Alvin Bragg's Manhattan District Attorney's Office, not even going back before that, but just looking at what he's done and looking at the process in particular. Let's start with somebody that's committed a, crim a criminal offense, a felony offense. Since 2019, after, if you compare 2019 to 2022 statistics, Alvin Bragg has declined to prosecute 35% less felonies than before. But even with those felonies that were charged, He's downgraded 52% of those felonies down to misdemeanors. Right. And even when you get past that, of those felonies that actually make it to trial, Alvin Bragg's office is only successful in about half of those cases. So when you start doing the mathematical calculations, if you're a criminal in this city that commits a felony, by the time he declines to prosecute and then downgrades a portion of that what's left and then actually prosecutes those that are left and is unsuccessful in about half of those cases, probably only one in five at best, maybe one in six or one in seven that commit a felony criminal offense in the city of New York City and in the Manhattan district in particular actually get convicted of that felony conviction. Is well, that true? That's counterproductive to, uh, to the victims of crime. Correct. And once convicted then, based on Alvin Bragg's day one memo, He's encouraged l less and less of those criminals to actually receive jail time. Isn't that true? That's correct. Now, how, do, how does that work with the morale of the NYPD? Well, we're seeing it now where we're having, uh, you know, so many members of the NYPD leaving uh, for other departments and detectives with years and years of experience and knowledge uh, retiring. Uh, it's going to have a major impact on public safety here in New York City. Yeah, does it actually affect their ability to perform their duties? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, if, again, uh, if you're not prosecuting the crime, uh, you know, again, you're putting your life on the line every time you encounter a, a criminal or a criminal element and just for this individual to be let out again and all your work was done for no, for no reason. I'd like to know what you're hearing because you have your ear to the ground. Ground. What are you hearing from the men and women, the brave men and women of the NYPD, about their desire to continue to serve under these kind of circumstances? It's, it's policing here in New York City is the most difficult I've seen it in 40 years. It's it's almost impossible for the, these young cops and old uh, and detectives to do their job effectively because you don't have a, a, a clear understanding and working relationship with the district attorney's office. And how does it affect their job and their ability to perform their job that about half of those actually charged with felonies are out on, without any bail at all, awaiting trial, and only about half are in? Well, it breaks the morale, of, and it breaks your desire uh, to serve and protect the people of the city. Do you see oftentimes when uh, these that have committed felonies that are awaiting uh, trial are actually out there committing more felonies while they're in their pretrial state? Well, that's the sad part about this. They're out again victimizing the people of the city. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's why uh, the morale 
in the NYPD is so low right now. One of the things that you mentioned in your testimony, your written testimony, is about juvenile offenders. Mm -hmm. Talk about juvenile offenders under Alvin Bragg's uh, district attorney's office, whether or not they're committing more crimes, whether or not they are incentivized to be part of gangs more than they were before. Well, it used to be 2% of the crimes in New York City. It's now double digits. And uh, they're committing more crimes, uh, carrying more firearms because they know there are no consequences. Yeah, and these are the illegal firearms that we've been talking about so much that Alvin Bragg's office has decided not to prosecute under existing law. Is that true? That's correct. All right. Thank you for your time. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Last but certainly not least, my friend and colleague, the gentleman from New Jersey, is recognized. Hi. You guys got to be tired. Um, I know after a while, you can almost have your eyes glaze over. I want to tell you, and I really mean this, and and there's a lot of people in this room who mean it. We appreciate you. We appreciate your bravery, your strength, your love for the ones that you lost. We appreciate the professionals who are here who are willing to speak up against all odds. This is a big deal. And without folks like you, without good Americans like you, without individuals who have the courage and strength to stand up the way that you do, we're definitely doomed. And I also want to promise you something else, and I think the chairman will will, will, would stick with me on this, and I think the members here would stick with it. We're going to do something. We absolutely didn't do this for an exercise. We absolutely didn't do this for politics. So I, I do want to say this to to my friends on the other side, you know, um, they threw out all kinds of stuff today, numbers that weren't real, a whole discussion of guns. You can have a lot of discussions on guns, but that wasn't what today was about. It wasn't a discussion about the guns. It was discussion about Alvin Bragg. They talked about George Santos, anti-Semitism, Donald Trump, money going from the NRA to members, which, by the way, I don't think it does, or else I'm surely the only one not getting it. But I asked a few people. I I don't think that's accurate either. That's an old political trick. Just so that you all who are sitting here at this table know, you put the shiny object up here. The shiny object is Donald Trump. So hopefully you, you hope that you all and that we all get so focused on his issues and get drawn into that. I don't give a damn about his issues right now. We'll deal with his issues and their important issues at another time. I care about your issues. We care about your issues. They should care about your issues, not all this other crap they threw out there. And I'm sorry, I'm a little rough around the edges sometimes, but I'm just telling you the truth. It's about time we hear the truth, and that's what the truth is. And the truth is this. I did write some things down, too, that crime rates in our biggest cities have risen to staggering levels. You know, when you say the crime rate or what's really going on, you can't just talk about somebody who is actually been prosecuted, was going to be prosecuted, but was released. That's why these numbers look down, because we're releasing everybody. We're not putting them in jail. Bad people should go in jail. That's where they belong. They shouldn't be out so they can hurt your wives, your children, your mothers, your fathers, your grandfathers. We want to be safe. And it doesn't matter if we're, you know, what color, what race, what origin we are. We want to be safe in our homes. You know, I I think of what goes on in Chicago. It's not only New York. My God, how many little black babies get shot every single week in that town? And we can stop it. We can stop it if we had good prosecutors. And who's funding these progressive district attorneys? We should know that. Well, it's George Soros. With this increase in crime, you would think their DA would be actively trying to slow it down. He's not. He's taking money from George Soros. No, I don't know any money from the NRA, but I'll tell you, there's tons of money, tens of millions. In fact, he spent $170 million. That's a lot of dough. 170 million in 2022 and 40 million, which was for local prosecutor elections. We never had money spent like that on prosecutor elections, and it's wrong. Prosecutors should run because they want to defend the law, help their police, and most of all, help you. God bless you after being a victim and losing people you love that you're here. I can't believe how strong you are. And the beg, the, you know what begs a question too? Who's worse? Is it a prosecutor who doesn't enforce the law or the criminal? 
Well, you know, the prosecutor who doesn't enforce the law has a broad effect across mm -hmm. the whole city and Good should point. know better and is taking his position, that position of such importance to be the legal guardian, to be the person that's the caretaker of our America, of our cities, of this great city of New York. And what does he do for politics? He doesn't care. The fact that he didn't sit down and shed some tears with you, it's unbelievable to me. The fact that he put you and accused you of murder. Troy was right before. A man tries to kill you, you've got to stop him. It's your right. But I guess he would have rather that you got killed. I don't understand it. And it's in New York City, it's in Chicago, it's in San Francisco, and this is the facts. Ah, oh, shoot. I had a few more seconds. A few more. Um, the, the bottom line is the facts are that all the Soros back district attorneys are doing this everywhere. It leads to more crime. And I'm going to say this I'm going to finish up. Gentlemen. And I think the answer is I think he should resign. I swear to God he should resign and he should be disbarred. Gentlemen's, uh, gentlemen, time has uh, expired. I want to. Uh, this concludes our, our hearing today. I want to thank our witnesses. I've been in. I've been in Congress a while, um, not quite as long as Mr. Nadler, but I've been there a while, and I don't know if I've ever had. We've, I've ever been a part of a hearing with more powerful witnesses telling your story. So thank you for your courage. Thank you for your patience, uh, for being here. Uh, God bless you all, and that uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Now, without objection, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>